Hey Bottom Pushers, my name is Nick and welcome back to the life and suffering of Sir Bronte. We are jumping all the way back to youth. We're going to restart the career aspect of things and still going to go down the noble route, but I need to work on getting my manipulation up because, no, not manipulation, scheming. I need to improve my scheming. So we're going to go back to youth. I'm going to do pretty much exactly what I did last time, but try and be a little bit more schemy about things. And then we will see how that leads us into peacetime. But my plan for peacetime is we're going to be a lot more career focused. We've done it for the people. We've saved the people. We've also doomed the people. But this time, screw the people. They're nothing. We are for the empire. We are for the career. We are for keeping the rules as they currently are. And yeah. So I'm hoping that's going to lead us to the empire revolt. And my family being honoured and ennobled by the sword this time, instead of falling apart and dying like they keep doing. So, we'll see. We'll see how this goes for me. But, I'm going to jump back, just run through all the decisions, and then we'll pick it up from there. Okay, so currently, Diplomacy's 13, Manipulation's 4, Theology's 5, Valor's, so Valor's good, Scheming, not so hot. First change in decision. I am going to, instead of going to the dueling club in the city that never sleeps, I am going to go to the secret salon because that boosts my scheming. Uh, going to the dueling club doesn't actually benefit me in any way. It gets me valor, but I have... And I think I could benefit from the scheming a lot more. So we'll do that. Interesting. So I am going to take a bit of a hit on willpower on this, but I think I might go for assuage my guilt when it comes to helping Sophia. Purely again because it ups my scheming. I'm hoping I don't take the hit on willpower too much. Like, I'm hoping that doesn't impact me too much further on. Plus, we've never done this, which is interesting. Because I obviously, I turn Sophia over to Otten. So if you help her now, it will make up for what you did to her. And she becomes embittered. Interesting. Thanks, Sonic. Why not? We'll go for it. You recall how you tried to turn Sophia over to Dorius Otten, her Arknian master, many years ago. And yet here she is, still coming to you, asking for help. You feel you have to make amends for the past. You promise to help Sophia. Bartholomew Dextra does not deserve this. He has to leave the capital. She can count on you. You aren't going to let her down this time. I'd hoped you'd grown up over these past few years. I'm glad to see I was right. I forgive you. You were following the Arknian's orders. I understand. You were born as servants, just like all of us. Now it's time to become your own master. But enough of that. We must act at once. Dextra's to be arrested tomorrow. Here's his address. Go there as soon as the sun sets. No one will suspect you. Cool. Okay, so now the rest of it's like the same as it was before. Cool, so we get him out of the city and all is well. Cool. Then she's trying to recruit me into the last straw, which it ain't happening, Missy. After what you did, Sophia realised that the world is cruel and does not deserve to be spared. Well, bullshit. <laughs> cool. So, Path of the Nobleman, done. Ennoble me, baby. No woman. <laughs> that didn't work. Okay, I'm going to try something this time. There was somebody in the comments that was saying that taking the bond of friendship is a bad idea. I think that person just hates Thomas and doesn't want me and Thomas to have the bond we have. But it's fine, I will listen to advice. Because <laughs> they're also the one that mentioned about my scheming, so I should probably listen to them. I'm not going to do this. So me and Thomas remain friends. I get willpower, which levels out my willpower again. So sure, why not? You're sure you'll do your best to keep your friendship alive, but you can't promise it will last forever. Which is fine, because, you know, I keep promising him eternal friendship and I keep letting him die, so... You don't take the ring, but simply pat Thomas on the shoulder. The two of you have walked side by side ever since you were children. Those years of friendship will always be there, but nobody knows what might come next. The two of you are walking different paths in life now. Why make promises you may not be able to keep? But now, the two of you are friends, and that's all that matters. With a sigh, Thomas puts the ring back in his pocket. Yeah, you're right. Nobody knows what's going to happen to us. Okay then. Let's not make any big promises. But at least we got tonight. Right, Bronte? How about we take a walk downtown and talk about old times? You wander to the banks of the River Aglata. The breeze blowing from the bay feels cool and gentle on your face. You recall the first time the two of you fought in your school days and all the adventures and escapades you had. Before you know it, the sun has set. You say goodbye to each other. You don't know if you'll ever meet again. I swear to God, if that comes back to bite me in the arse... Because nothing ever comes back to bite me in the arse in this game. Okay, so we're at the ball. Octavia Melanidas, in disguise, has asked... In disguise, she's wearing a mask. 
has asked us to dance, but at the same time, Thomas has made a damn fool of himself behind and Doris Otten's having a go at him. So I'm going to do what I did before and dance with the mysterious lady, because then Octavia will remember me. So exactly as we did before, we shall dance the night away with Lady Octavia. And I'm full of power now. Full of it. And Sir L. Cruz lesson. So we've gone here with Thomas and he's told us about Sharmalanadas and the siege of Hanazot and everything and asked what we would do in this position. I, what did I do before? I did press for a decisive assault because it upped my valour and seemed like the right thing to do. But I'm going to lay siege to the palace this time, theoretically of course, because that increases, increases my valour and scheming. You would have starved the city into submission and seized it by cunning. Also, this should go without saying at this point, if you haven't watched any of the previous videos, you should probably go back and watch them, because I'm jumping through things very quickly. You decide it's time for you to answer Sir El Cruz. The proper way to bring down the castle of Anazot would have been through a prolonged siege, you say. The lands of Margra could no longer feed the warriors of Sharmalanadas at that stage of the rebellion, and when their supplies eventually ran out, they would have opened the gate from the inside. Sir El Cruz looks at you, studying you attentively. I agree with what you're saying, young warrant, eh? In a sense. Had the Imperial forces done that, they would have lost fewer men and kept the palace of Anazot intact. Yet you are missing my other point here. Malanadas's army would have continued fighting, even emaciated by the siege, even with their numbers dwindling. True, some did flee, but those who stayed to defend the city and the castle, even after the Imperial forces broke in, remained loyal to their lord until the very end. Long ago, only Arcanians had the right to wield weapons and wage war, but now humans can prove their merit and earn the same right humans like ourselves. And the present empire has grown even stronger thanks to its new warriors and functions. These days, humans can judge and rule and create. The terrors wrought by the rebellious duke are undeniable, yet his rebellion created new possibilities for all of us. And this, young men, is the moral of the story. Sharmalanadas was defeated, but not by the clergy and their prayers, or not even by the noble militias assembled by the archdukes. He was vanquished by the imperial legions. A unified army with clear regulations and ranks and a clear chain of command. An army that is strong in discipline and loyalty to the Empire. His eyes finally move away from you and back to the rest of the young men in the hall. But nobody else dares argue with the battle-hardened officer. The evening continues. Sir Elkru shares some of his war stories, each more astounding than the last. For the rest of the nights, you're out of the Baron's centre of attention. And so you join Thomas and the other cadets in sipping wine and enjoying his tales. He returns to the college after midnight. You often recall Baron El Cruz's story about the rebellion of Sharma Lanadas after that. The rebellious duke lost the war, and yet he brought about drastic changes for humans and the entire empire. Okay. That was alright. He obviously wasn't the correct answer, but it was alright. Okay, so my first case involves Alice, who we know from other storylines, being brought in to the prefecture... Is it a prefecture? Well, to my judge room as a harlot who was committing lewd acts with a nobleman in front of somewhere they shouldn't have been doing it, and we have to interrogate them. Before I found... Well, we can interrogate them. Before I found the nobleman, which upped my diplomacy, but I think I am just going to up my willpower this time, because I don't need the manip... Uh, yeah, I don't really need the manipulation, I don't think, and the willpower I'd rather not take a hit on. And diplomacy is fine where it is at the moment, I guess. And having 20 willpower would not be a bad thing. Yeah, I'll really say this. Why not? You dismiss the gendarme and priest and tell them you'll take it from here. You're alone with Alice now. Flecks of gold dancing in her eyes, beckoning, calling you to immerse yourself in their light. You feel your lips open almost on their own, saying the only words that feel right at this moment. You won't open a case against her. It would be a waste of time and effort. She's free to go. She looks straight into your eyes. Her gaze feels warm and soothing. Would you come with me then, your honour? You comply and guide the lady of the evening through the halls of the prefecture. It doesn't even occur to you to argue with her. The two of you emerge from the building. You start to shiver from the cold night wind. Alice is wearing only a thin dress. How is she not freezing in this weather? The twin's love keeps me warm. With a smile, Alice places her fingers on your chest, as though showing you where this love resides. Even through your jacket, you can feel the warmth emanating from her. It's more than human warmth. Something more. Something greater. Something higher. Her lips gently touch yours.
Well, I wasn't expecting this to happen. Oh, you don't recall how you ended up in a room at the nearest inn. Ayla slides the dress off her shoulders smoothly and easily, like a snakeskin, while you fumble out of your clothes. The bed beckons. Your bodies intertwine. The taste of her lips is intoxicating. But you know, you feel this is more than just a union of two bodies. Hold up. I am 18. This is okay. I was I, I was concerned for a minute then. I'm literally just in the process of becoming monetized. I don't want that taken away straight away. Alice places her fingers on your head and guides your gaze towards her eyes. And you are filled with love. The very love you've known ever since the moment of your birth. This is true love. Pure love. A love that cannot be imitated. This is precisely who the twins created you to be. All doubts, all worries are gone. You are immolated in this golden, loving glow. The utter joy is so intense, it almost tears you apart. You don't sleep that night, yet you don't feel tired in the morning. On the contrary, there's a perfect clarity about your mind and a fresh spring in your step. Alias the Harlot is asleep beside you, her golden hair strewn across the pillow. You quietly place her pay on the bedside tape and then look you quietly place her pay on the bedside table and look at her one last time before closing the door softly behind you. <sighs> Good lord. Okay, that's not how I expected that to go, but it did. This furthers my theory about Niklaus Bronte being a bit of a man whore. A great feast for all. So there is a coming of age festival for Jerian, I want to say. Is it Jerian? Yes, Jerian Tempest. And obviously there's been a little bit of unhappiness around because of the whole college being shut down thing. But that's open again now. But is people are just a little bit unhappy about everything. And they're kind of, they're asking for guarantees that something like that won't happen again. And their rights aren't going to get taken away. So we are told to disperse uh, or to carry on with the celebrations, sorry. But people are being like, no, 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 no. We want answers, damn it. Uh, before I demanded my rights, which upped my valour, which I didn't really need to do, uh, I can follow the order, which ups my diplomacy, or I can bide my time, which maxes out my willpower. Which I think I'm going to do. It knocks the power down a little bit, but meh, I don't really care about that. Um, I'm going to take maximum willpower, because I feel like that's really going to help me. You decide to wait while others demand a new law, and still others try to restore order. Nobody knows how this will end. In the meantime, you conserve your energy and watch the events unfold. The chant grows louder with every second. The law! The law! Academy officers are trying to shout the vocal cadets and students into submission and order them back into the procession, but they're barely heard above the chant. Still, some submit and form back into columns, but the impassioned chant continues and you find yourself in the very heart of the chanting crowd. Thomas walks right past you, waving his arms wildly, calling for you to join the chant. The law! The law! But you don't respond, and Thomas gives up on you. He moves to the centre of the square where the vocal future nobles are gathering. An Imperial Guard cavalry regiment emerges from the palace. They start slowly advancing on the crowd, hands on their swords, pushing people out of the square. The end of this conflict is clear. Another moment, and the cavalry will crush the disobedient youths. You swiftly manoeuvre away from danger and rejoin the semblance of a column in the procession. The orders of the academy officers and cadets finally have some effect. Most students submit and return to their columns. The commotion in the square is quelled and the cavalry withdraws. Emperor Uther II appears on the balcony again. Archduke Monroe, the Emperor's great chancellor, stands by his side. The square falls silence at the sight of the sovereign. My subjects, I can see how overjoyed you are for Prince Jerion, but your show of reverence and gratitude is clear enough. Now follow the great chancellor's order and obey my will. Continue the parade, and sing the praises of the Tempest dynasty that has given you so much. The square obediently lines up into columns once again. The bout of defiance is in the past now, and they resume the festive parade through the city streets. You march along with your column, you steered clear of the commotion and all the useless rebellion, and now everything is back as it should be. Glory to Emperor Uther, glory to Prince Jerian. 30 willpower, hot jiggity. So the way of the sword, the I have become a nobleman, and as is tradition of the college, there is a fencing tournament, or a dueling tournament, sorry, not fencing tournament. Uh, there's a dueling tournament that takes place, and 
I'm fighting in it. So I'm going to dedicate the fight to my father again like I did before, which means I'm going to win because I can use that win later on. And Lady Octavia becomes intrigued by me. And that brings us to the end of youth. Uh, let's have a quick stat check. So diplomacy 15, theology don't care about, manipulation 6, valor 19, uh, scheming 11. Can't remember what it was before, but probably better than that. In fact, wait, scheming is well, kind of low. So scheming was on 8 before. I think I'm going to go for Knight of the Serpents. I think that's the route I'm going down this time. So career needs to be maxed out. I need to have made a deal with Remy L. Vermin and my family needs to have not fallen apart, which is good. And I want to be an over by the sword, which means reputation has to be eight, wealth has to be five, and unity has to be three, equal to or above. And obviously, ideally, we want mother to recover. So unity really needs to be above eight. Is that going to happen? Oh, uh, almost certainly not. But you never know. First day on the job. So it's the first day of our new job at the prefecture back in Anazot, and we've met Augustine L. Bourne under our official capacity, it's him being our boss, and we've also met Carlo Folkgraven, who's a, he's another judge, and a bit of a, the career person, he's very empire heavy, so I feel like I'm going to need to become friends with him. So on my first day, I need to prepare to deal with my first cases, which gets my willpower up, which is unnecessary. I can get acquainted with the judges, which ups my career and knocks down my justice, or ask Father for advice, which does the opposite. So I'm going to get acquainted with the judges before I ask Father for advice. Sir Folk Graben's offer seems rather reasonable now that you think about it. You dedicate some time to the cases and necessary paperwork, then shift the case folders aside and walk to the office across from yours. Judge Folk Graben greets you warmly. Sir Bronte, how splendid of you to stop by. Come, let us pay a few visits to the most distinguished of your new colleagues. I'm sure they'll be delighted to make acquaintance of such a promising young man. With that, Folk Raven leads you through the corridors of the prefecture. As you walk down the hall, he starts mentioning other judges by name and origin, age and experience, power and influence. You stop by a number of other judges' offices. Judges' offices is really hard to say. Hours pass in dignified greetings bowing, pats on the shoulder, and courteous conversation. One after another, the judges make it quite clear to you that when a noble and a commoner clash in the courtroom, the court is to side with the noble every time, no matter how affluent the commoner may be. Only when both parties hail from the commoner states may a judge fully rely upon the rule of law. Before you know it, your first day at the prefecture is over. Just look at how much you've accomplished in one day, Bronte. So many experienced judges, and you've made a splendid impression on all of them. Your future is all but assured now, I guarantee it. But remember, cautious words are not the only thing that matters at the prefecture. Your decisions will not go unnoticed. Niklaus, my friends, I greatly hope your youthful exuberance will not result in any gaffes that may hinder our mutual efforts at maintaining order in our province. Act with wisdom in mind, especially when the wisdom of your colleagues is always within reach. You say farewell to the elegant, affable judge and walk to the carriage outside waiting to take you home. With so many useful acquaintances made at the prefecture today, your career will surely prosper. However, there is a burden of expectation upon you. They want you to fall in line and side with noble privilege without a second thought. However, the conflict between the noble and common estates is growing tenser by the day. It will only become harder to uphold the law in the future. Nah. We'll be fine, because the Empire must win. So, you know, we're having a lovely dinner party at the Bronte residence, and I'm going to talk about my victory in the tournament, I think. Yes, because that gets my reputation up by two. Yeah, so exactly as I did before, just talk about how amazing I am, basically, because, I mean, it's true. What are we going to do with Stefan and Gloria? So their arguments are at a boiling point, so I can not appeal to Nathan. Damn. <laughs> okay, because that would have helped Unity. Okay. I think I'm going to defend Gloria. Gloria? Gloria. Which does knock down the reputation by one, but that's okay because I can rebuild that quickly. Well, I can rebuild that quicker than I can rebuild Unity. And I need Unity to be better than it currently is. So, cool. I don't think I've ever done this before, actually. You turn to Stefan abruptly and point your finger at him. It's no wonder Gloria fights back so fiercely. Stefan torments and chastises her incessantly. If your elder brother stops smothering every impulse Gloria has, 
so you won't resist so viciously. You're a family after all, not a pack of wild animals where the strong dominate the weak. Are you blaming me for her escapades, Nicklaus? Me, who selflessly labours to preserve our family name? This is outrageous. Father, will you really heed to his advice? Purple with rage, Stefan clenches his fists. Father rises from his seat, eyeing his eldest son gloomily. Niklaus is right. Stefan, you have overstepped your bounds. I took Gloria into my house, so you, my son, must respect her and be considerate of her. Your origins do not give you the right to put such pressure on your sister. Stefan rushes out of the office and slams the door behind him. Gloria can't conceal her joy upon hearing you and father chastise Stephen. Stefan. The little tyrant. That will teach him what goes around comes around. Hope he leaves me be from now on. Soon, rumours start circulating in Anazot High Society, suggesting that you are orchestrating a plot against Stefan, the legitimate heir of the family. It's not hard to guess who started those rumours. Now the entire city knows that there is trouble in the Bronte household. Well, shut up. Ah, my first trial. So it's a land dispute between a noble and a commoner. The noble has sold the commoner some, some land on his property. He's built a dye works. The nobleman now doesn't like it, so wants it to be demolished. But in the contract, the commoner's perfectly within his rights to do it. But the noble thinks he should be able to do what he wants because he is a noble. And in this instance, I am inclined to agree. Filthy, filthy commoners. I can comply with Elavila's demands and tear it down. Terminate the rental agreement. Ooh, it does increase my reputation. But also, oh, and bumps up my career. Okay. Not that it takes down my willpower a little bit, but thankfully I have excess willpower. So I propose a new law that would grant noble landowners the right to terminate their rental agreements in court at any time. Which seems like I'm being a dick, but I'm being a dick within the law. Instead of just, yeah, screw you commoner. Tui. Plus, you know, reputation. No matter what the agreement says, no commoner has the right to construct a production facility on nobles' lands without the noble's permission. Presently, however, you cannot reasonably terminate such a contract between a commoner and a noble, which means that the prefecture needs to pass a law to this effect. You postpone the verdict and Sir Sel El Avila and Basil Young to leave for now. The prefecture does more than judge cases and resolve litigation. It also generates regulations that have the force of law within the province and even the youngest judge in the employ of the prefecture may suggest a new regulation. When it comes to land agreements, it's clear that the province needs to guarantee that any noble has the right to terminate any agreement that impinges upon the ownership of their lands. And so you meticulously compose a proposal for a new provincial law. Ownership of land, you write, is a foundation of noble authority. For, along with a noble title, it is one of the boons granted to those ennobled by the sort. The noble is the sovereign of his land, and so he must have the right to recover that land if need be. The other judges eagerly support your draft, given the many litigations of this kind between nobles and commoners they face every year. It'll present them with a quick and effortless solution. Eventually, even the Emperor's overseer in Magra, Gaius Tempest, sanctions this regulation. With the name Bronte mentioned therein, your standing with Anazot High Society improves. Once the new regulations is in force, you reopen Elavila's case. Now, armed with legal justification, you terminate his rental agreement with Basil Jung and restore the noble's ownership of the land. The dye works is to be demolished. What are you saying, you rudder? I put all I had into this. My family will starve. Your decision is now backed by a provincial regulation, you remind him. And even stubborn Basil Jung has no choice but to accept it. The hapless dyer is a sorry sight. His broad shoulders hunched and drooping. The man has nothing more to say. He is ruined, and he knows it. Oh, you have my thanks, Sir Bronte. This certainly took longer than I expected, but the land rights of all nobles in Margra are now well protected against scheming lowborn tenants who have grown rich beyond measure. Now rest assured, the other nobles of the sword will hear of your integrity. Many newspapers have appeared in Anazot of late, and today every single one of them writes about your law. Many periodicals praise the young judge from the Bronte family as the protector of timeless noble rights. Other newspapers, however, condemn the regulation openly. They claim that it renders pointless any and all rental agreements in the province. The common estate now has no secure foundation on which to ensure the security of their trade and production facilities, since all land suitable for construction belongs to the noble estate. Well, have you tried not being of the common estate? Okay. Up to seven on career. Nope. Up to six on career. Moving in the right direction. Ah, uh, okay. So at this point before, career was here. 
Oops. I don't know if anything bad happens if justice hits zero, but we're probably going to find out. Your most recent verdict seems to have convinced the nobles of their absolute impunity and complete rule over the Lowborn Estates. And now the commoners in every corner of the province grovel and scream as their landlords take and punish and humiliate. Any attempts to appeal to justice will not succeed. The judges reject all complaints against the nobles without even reading them. Today, there's a large gathering of people in the square in front of the prefecture. But this is no festivity, no celebration, no joyous occasion. This is a mob of commoners, and they have come to ask for justice. Many are on their knees, begging, praying. Those with the loudest voices stand on tall barrels screaming at the prefecture. Do you hear us, Sir Prefect? We ask for justice, we beg for protection. The tax is too high, we cannot pay it twice. Our families starve, but we must pay our last coin to the Duke and then the Overseer. Prefect Elborn watches the crowd from his window, lost in thoughts. He knits his brow and he turns to face you. This is how a riot begins, Bronte. The commoners are only asking for justice now. If they don't get it, they will try force soon enough. Imagine what will happen if they all bring torches next time. The noble lot is to rule, yes, but we must rule wisely and provide for those we rule over. Too many nobles think the law was written only for the common folk. It pains me to say it, but you seem to be among them, Bronte. But you seem wise enough, Sir Judge, so put your wisdom to use. Go outside and set things right. Something must be done about them before this mob turns into a stampede. Take Captain Linard and his men and go to the square. You have to calm these people. They have to disperse before the noble militia notices them and reaches for their swords. And then there won't be an end to the bloodshed. Help me buy some time, and we will defuse the situation together. You're in the square. You stand on the steps of the prefecture, surrounded by gendarmes, searching for the leaders of the mob. In the middle of the crowd, standing on a wooden crate, you see a woman dressed in trousers and a jacket, gesticulating wildly. Truth and justice! Truth and justice! Gloria, goddammit. Gloria used to recite poetry like that when you were children. But she is not a couch. No, she is not a couch. She is a woman. But she's not on a couch in your home anymore. She now stands in the middle of a roiling human sea. She sees you, and for a moment her voice trails off. But then she starts chanting to the crowd even louder. Give us the law! Give us the law! Another ringleader notices you in the meantime. A sturdy, bald man with a short beard and the appearance of a craftsman. You're finally here, my lord. You're Judge Bronte. We know you well. We know you quite well. We're looking for a way to help His Highness Gaius Tempest hear our pleas. If the Prefecture can't protect us, then His Highness is our only hope. The cries and screams grow louder and fiercer. Slowly, the mob of petitioners begins to advance towards the Prefecture. The gendarmes are ready to fight back. Captain Linard eyes the crowd, awaiting your orders. So I can have them all dispersed. Which knocks down my willpower. And my unity. Uh, kill the ringleader. Good lord. Uh, grant their request. This takes my career down by three, which is not happening. I think I'm going to have to have the mob dispersed. This knocks me down to 20 willpower and three unity. Which my unity is of my great it's my greatest concern at this point. You shake your head at Schmidt. There can be no negotiating as long as this mob threatens the peace and order of the city, you tell the ball instigator. Then, in a louder voice, you address the entire crowd. Any attempts to pressure the authorities into action will lead to nothing but bloodshed, and you will not condone it. Everyone must disperse immediately. Those who continue to disturb the peace will be arrested. The mob stops, confused by your words, but the voices of the ringleaders spur the people onwards. From far away, you hear Gloria cry out. You gonna arrest me too, Judge? Don't. I'll, I'll do it. Don't think I won't do it, I'll do it. You switch from talk to action. At your order, the gendarmes surge forward like bloodhounds, cleaving through the panic strip and mob with their blackjacks. You're there, giving orders, making sure no leader of this march escapes. You've surrounded them on their crates and barrels, then bound and arrested. People start fleeing the square, leaving only mud and the stench of human sweat behind. Gloria is rounded up as well. She's escorted to the prefecture jail along with the other leaders of the march. Her hands and theirs bound by the same long rope. Your own sister screams and curses you as you march them to their cells. Have you forgotten that you used to be lowborn too? You knows. This is all your fault. You never listen to us. You just squeeze us dry. I, I hate you. Gloria tries to swing her arms at you, but she's tied too tightly. You try not to look your sister in the eye. 
Unsettled by the mob, the judges greet you as a victor. You were hard on the people, but you defended the prefecture and prevented a full-scale riot. Most of the rabble-rousers you had arrested are released before the day ends. It's Elborn's order. The prefect doesn't want to inflame the people even more when tensions in the city are already running high. Friedman Schmidt leaves his cell and walks away, giving you a mockery of a bow. Behind him, out walks Gloria, her head hanging low. Father's arm is around her shoulder. He glances at you furiously as they walk past you in cold, bitter silence. I mean... Come on now. What was I to do? <laughs> Probably not that. We've been sent a box of jewels by Archduke Melanidas in, a, in an attempt to win the favour over to his side of the dispute that's going on between him and Overseer Tempest, but we are supporters of Tempest in this household. So before I gave the jewels to the nobleman, which upped my reputation by two. However, I'm going to decline the gift this time because not only does that bump my willpower back up to 20, it also gives me plus two unity which I sorely need. So we've done this before, so we send them back to the Melanidases with a letter saying, uh, thank you, but no. So hopefully the taking the unity is a good approach. It's knocked my relation with uh, Archduke Melanidas down a little bit though, which I hope is okay. Otten has called us into his office to discuss his grand plans for the future, and he wants to basically build us up to the point where we can put Dorius Otten on trial, because Dorius Otten is a notorious scumbag. But he's an Arcanium, which makes him damn near untouchable. So I'm still going to side with Elborn. I'm not going down the route of trying to get Otten this time, but I feel like siding with Elborn is still a wise decision. Okay, so yeah, that gets me up by two with him. So not a bad position for me to be in. It's always good when the boss likes you. Damn it, Thomas. I, I thought I could walk away this time, but I can't. It's because we're bound by friendship. Son of a bitch. I didn't take the ring, but I wasn't harsh. Oh, no, I couldn't. I don't think I could have walked away. Fine. I'm going to go have dinner with Thomas then, and I get willpower, which is great, but I lose reputation. Thanks, Thomas. Well, I'm maxed out on willpower again now, though, so that's something. Uh, the newspaper case. So the common estate, they've created their own newspaper, which the nobles don't like because they're not being very nice about the nobles in it. And we've been given the case to kind of figure out what is the best thing to do here with this newspaper. So the newspaper itself is run by Mayor Egmont, who's very much like a, a leader of the common people. He wants people's rights to be improved. You've got Remy L. Vermin, who I need to make a deal with later on, so I need to keep him on side. He wants it shut down on behalf of the noble estate. And then you've got Folk Graben comes in and is like, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't you shut it down? Go keep hold of it, and we can make some sweet cash. Which I couldn't do before, but I can now do. Ooh, interesting. Um... Okay, so I can shut down the Gazette, which ups my career, downs my justice. Do not show down the Gazette. Man, if this route has so many more spelling and grammar errors than any of the other playthroughs. I don't know whether I'm just more aware of it now, or it's this playthrough, but goddamn. Legitimize the Gazette, which ups my career and my justice, but knocks down my will, which I don't want. Okay, I'm going to seize the printing press. I'll take the hit on the career and the justice. Because career's at 7, I, sh I should be able to build that back up quite easily. Uh, wealth and reputation go up, which is good. Scheming goes up, which isn't bad. And Elborn goes down by 2. It's fine. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. You decide to follow Judge Folk Raven's cunning plan. You and your family could come out of this tricky case better off. And Magistrate El Vermin will not be disappointed. However, this plan requires discretion. The fewer people learn about the seizure of the print shop, the better. You draft the property seizure order against Mayor Egmans, the owner of the Gazettes, and present it to Prefect Elborn to be signed. Did I see this right? You think it's necessary to shut down the newspaper and seize Egmans' property too? But you have an answer ready. The Lesser Quorum's newspaper is an affront to the senior nobles and a threat to the peace in the province. Now is not the time to incite more tensions between the estates, but if all you do is ban the Gazettes, you add, Egmont will quickly repurpose the press and spread their message in other ways. Very well, Bronto. I trust your judgment. I hope you know what you're doing. Me too. A squad of gendarmes in tow, you set off to search Eggman's print shop. You find the printing press, the movable type, the frames and the inks, and confiscate them. The owner of the Gazette, Mayor Eggman, is quick to arrive. He looks almost like a nobleman. Eggman is well-groomed and wears expensive clothing only a wealthy industrialist could afford. Nevertheless, his rough manner of speaking and boorish posture betray his humble origins. You've got quite the nerve, Sir Bronte. You have the right to ban the newspaper, but this print shop is my property, 
I brought it with money I earned with my own two hands. Instead of an answer, you coldly present him with an order signed by Prefect Delborn. I see. So the law and the prefecture have no justice for the common folk. But you, Sir Bronte, how long have you been a noble yourself? Did you already forget how it feels to be under someone else's thumb all the time? Let me tell you, the times are changing. We won't be silenced so easily. All the fuming industrialist can do is watch the gendarmes load his printing press onto a car and take it away. Once the matter of the print shop is settled, you pay Carlo Folkgraven a visit. Most expertly done, Bronze. I shall present the printing press to the nobles of the quorum post haste. They will handle the newspaper initiative from here on out. This act is not going to notice that the noble quorum owes your family a great debt. I've already made the arrangements. Your family will not have to pay the Archduke tax for two years. This is a great honour. Only nobles of the sword are exempt from taxation. Elborn soon learns of the shady deal you've made. Bronte, I hear you've already repurposed the confiscated printing press. Oh, this is a dangerous game you're playing. Some might consider it an abuse of your position as judge. I will not tolerate such scheming in the future. Indeed, many people at the prefecture consider your actions unworthy of a judge, and the outraged commoners of the Lesser Quorum have lost faith in the justice system. Nevertheless, the arrangement has earned your family new privileges, which means more money for the Brontes and more improved standing with the nobility. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh, this is possibly a mistake. Well, let's find out. When I die. March of the Desperate. Okay. Let's see if I can avoid absolute carnage. An enormous mob is marching through the streets of Anazot. Men, women, young, old, emaciated faces, tattered rags, stomachs bloated from hunger, crying newborns in the arms of old women. Their moans and cries can be heard from far away. The people are walking toward the city hall. The provincial council is in session today. The overseer has ordered you to prevent any blood from being shed on the streets of Anazot tonight. You walk with resolve to face the mob. Three squabs of gendarmes follow you grimly. The tension runs so high you can feel it on your skin. You know full well that the commoners have taken to the streets because of the choices you have made. The lowborn folk have been deprived of the last of their rights. They're wide open to the tyranny of the nobles, with no way to defend themselves. Brassmen and workers, farmers and wealthy commoners, they all suffer at the hands of the nobles for the smallest infraction. And every day the prefecture receives reports of unpunished looting, arson and murder. The march approaches you and stumbles into a halt, confused and uneasy. You take a moment to study the crowd. The commoners are humble and silent. They're unarmed. The recent years of tyranny have squeezed the very idea of revolt from their mind. They will shed no blood. Good. Well, I am fully embracing my role as a really bad person here, aren't I? You call for the gendarmes to give way and follow the mob while you look for the leader of this march. In the front rows, you notice a priest of considerable age clad in a white cassock. You recognise him, Father Lenart, abbot of the temple at the Silver Tree. We go to City Hall, Sir Judge. The Provincial Council must see the children of Magra. If we cannot appeal to their conscience, there must be some pity left in their hearts. The twins know the common folk can bear this burden no longer. The councilmen must witness their handiwork, face their shame and show mercy. Their law has brought us nothing but suffering. The march has almost reached the square in front of the city, but then it suddenly stops. You hurry to the front, following the angry cries. Soldiers are blocking the road, a punitive battalion of the Imperial Legion. You scowl. The battalion came to the city with Dorius Otten, by commander of Marlborough, after a full year of burning, pillaging and looting migrant villages who had refused to pay the tax a second time. The commoners are huddling together. The back rows are trying to push to the front. The Legion soldiers hold the line. It will not take long for someone to cast the first stone and then blood will be shed. Father Lennart takes a step forward. Let the common people go to the city hall. The leaders must see what has become of the city without justice. Silence. Anyone who takes a step forward after this false priest will see the twins before their time. The gendarmes help you reach the square. You head straight for the battalion officer, a tall legion captain with red hair and cold eyes. You inquire about their orders. We are your own commander Rotten's orders. We are to protect the provincial council and hold the lowborn away from the city hall. Battalion, form rank. Moving as one like a well-oiled machine, the legion soldiers form a line to block the road, a wall of shields bristling with swords. The mob stops, even as the back rows keep pushing. The soldiers start banging their shields on the ground. 
a terrible clanging rhythm that causes even the crying newborns to freeze in terror. Swordsmen, form a line. Sullen swordsmen line up behind the shield bearers, ready to draw their weapons and step to the front at any moment. You ask the captain a question. Do they really want to attack these people? Why not? I'm following the commander's orders. My men can't wait. Sir Ron says anyone looting in the city will face true death, but my boys don't like going home empty-handed. At least they'll have their fun. The captain studies you for a moment, then ponders for a while. He steps very close to you and continues in a low voice on the verge of a whisper. You know, I could cooperate and hold my men back, let them march to the city hall, but I've got to get some gold in my pockets, you know what I mean? You stare back at the Legion officer, astonished. These are the men that Austin has recruited for his punitive battalions. The march has stopped. The front lines led by Father Lennart stand their ground, unwilling to retreat. But the mob behind them is growing louder, angrier and more frantic. The Legion soldiers keep slamming their shields into the ground. They'll advance onto the mob any moment now. The red-haired captain is casting glances at you, ready to give the word. Your gendarmes stand by your side, blackjacks clutched in their nervous hands. Okay, bribe the Legion captain, no and no, on the wealth and reputation. Give the Legion free reign. Ugh. Or protect the common folk. Which kills me and halves my career. Are you kidding me? Sweet baby Jesus. Now I'm going to give the Legion free reign. It knocks my career down by one, but... I feel like I need to do it. That's the lesser of all three of these evils in terms of stats. I mean, the most in terms of evil actual events, but, you know, screw everyone else. I'm all about stats. What about me? You call back the gendarmes and let the punitive battalion do what they must. I wash my hands of this situation. This situation I created. You step aside. You have no intention of bribing Legion soldiers. As you wish, Sir Prefecture. Then uh, I'll go ahead and carry out my orders. Forwards. You order the gendarmes to retreat and form up away from the battalion. Bloodshed is inevitable now, but you won't be involved in it. Still banging their shields, the Legion soldiers attack. The wall of shields pushes the people back step by step, further and further. The rear rows press the front ones. In the chaos, people are no longer able to turn around. The moaning heard throughout the square becomes a roar. The shield bearers make way and the swordsmen advance. The battalion rolls through the crowd. The soldiers are merciless and precise. They chop off heads and rip open stomachs. There's no cruelty in their actions, only serenity and firmness, like a butcher at the slaughter. Row after row of dead bodies fall at the soldiers' feet. The corpses of children fade away almost instantly, off to be reborn. The elderly remain on the pavement. <sighs> you observe the slaughter from the side, securely surrounded by a formation of gendarmes. The next day, you have to give an account of the march to Prefect Belborn. Up until the very end, I didn't believe the Legion would choose to use their weapons. As many people were trampled as were slain by swords, the damn cutthroats. And you, Sir Nicolaus Bronte, were powerless to protect the people, as always. The worst part of it is that not even such a bold march has persuaded our governing elite to listen to their lower estate and give them back at least some of their rights. Mark my words. This slaughter will lead to a rift throughout the entire empire. Ew. Poopies. The Call of the Ancestors. We've gone down to the crypt to speak to the ghost of Sir Gregor, which is, you know, always entertaining. Uh, Stefan tries to muscle his way in as the head of the family, but we're going to side with Father again and tell Stefan to stop. So it knocks down my relation with Stefan a little bit, but I uh, get some unity out of it. But we've done this many, many times before. I say many, many times, I think actually every single time. Yeah, I still have loads of time to get my career up, so... This is fine. This is fine. The Vassal and the Lord. So Octavia Melanidas has been sent by her papa to have a little chat with Sir Elborn and say, hang on a minute, we know what you're doing. We know you're trying to enforce the law on noble people a bit too much, and we don't like it. It's not how any of them speak, but you get the point. Uh, so I can either side with Elborn, side with Octavia, or defuse the situation. I am going to defuse the situation uh, because it is the only way I don't take kind of big hits on everything. So, well, not big hits, but multiple hits on everything. So we did this before, so we do just, as it says, defuse the situation. Nobody gets pissy. 
I lose a bit of willpower. It's kind of a half decent result. But now, I get a letter from Lady Octavia. Well, I get a letter from the Archduke themselves, although it's not the Archduke. We go to Serpent Verda, which is their castle, and we are met by Lady Octavia, who's like, You, human Bronte, I've had my eye on you. I want to be your owner. She wants me as her plaything, basically. I can submit to her, which ups my reputation. I can insist on being treated as equals, which means we grow close. Or I can reject her and become scorned. Now I'm going to do what I did before and insist on being treated as an equal. So we know this. We'll go, excuse me, Lady Octavia. How dare you? I am not a plaything. I am a man. And you will treat me as such. So now we have grown close. And we... We... We, we had sex. Such a child. Oh, good. This is going to screw up unity and reputation even more, isn't it? So Stefan and Nathan have got themselves arrested for Nathan's debauchery and Stefan's penchant for stabbing commoners. Oh, you know what? I can use my authority, which I think I did before, actually. Yeah, because Elborn doesn't like it. That's fine. Yeah, so I will use that, do that before. Knocks down Drop Justice literally can't get any lower, so that's fine. Stefan goes up, Nathan goes up, Augustine goes down. So, uh, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Father Mark has been arrested. Now, Father Mark is the preacher who his prophecy is the twins are shit. Uh, literally his exact words. Uh, he says to people, he preaches that people shouldn't be following the twins. People should actively forget about the twins and just live their life. Which obviously, in the eyes of the Inquisition, is heresy. And in the eyes of the law, is against it. But he has been arrested. And he's been brought to us. And Jen from the Inquisition, you remember Jen from the other playthroughs, like zealous old faith believer. Uh, she She's come from the Inquisition, she wants to take Father Mark into their custody. So we can either hand him over to the Inquisition, which knocks down my justice, oh no, or set him free, which knocks down my career, but does increase my wealth and scheming. No, if my career was higher, then I may consider that, but I'm going to hand him over to the Inquisition. I think I judged him last time. Yes, I'm just going to hand him over to the Inquisition. He can be their problem. For a while, you consider your options, then you get up from your chair and give the gendarmes a signal. They obediently lead him to Sister Jen. She allows herself the luxury of a brief smile. Thank you for being so reasonable, Your Honour. I knew you had great potential ever since we first met. Rest assured, Father Mark will never break another law, whether sacred or secular. Now his sycophants will be able to hide from us no longer, thanks to you. Oh, if you ask me, it's all thanks to you, Your Honour. Not that there's any difference, though. If you think about it, you're just a puppet of the alien will of the gods, same as the rest of us. The gendarmes unceremoniously stuff a gag in Father Mark's mouth to protect you from his heretical notions. Sister Jen takes the apostate away to the dungeons of the Inquisition for his long overdue punishment. You soon receive new reports. Interrogation and torture yielded the Inquisition the names of several of Father Mark's followers, all of whom were caught quickly. The pyres light up the streets of Anazot. Imperial law has no power here. For judging heretics is the domain of the Inquisition. As Prophet Isaitius teaches us, the earthly must remain upon the earth, the heavenly in heaven. The Prefecture's duty is to enforce the law upon the earth. The laws of heaven are beyond the scope of your authority. And so you say a prayer to the younger twin. You're filled with the power of law that you serve, so intense it's almost overwhelming. The law is one of the three manifestations of the twins. The law is your calling. Okay. That seemed, seemed like it. Okay, I need my career to be bolstered quite substantially. The road to the top. I'm... We get an invitation from Remiel Vermin, and he wants to become friends with us. Which is what I need, so I need to have made a deal with Remiel Vermin. Ooh, which also betrays Augustine L. Bourne. Interesting. Okay. Well, that then opens up Otten faces the Court of Honor because this gets me patronage of the powerful, which I need for this. So if my career... Cool. That means I have options. So if my career only gets to an 8 or a 9, I don't get it all the way up to 10, then I have this as, an, as a fallback option. I just need to remember not to disband the Court of Honor. Awesome. So this does bolster my career quite nicely. Splendid. After some contemplation, you respond that you're willing to be the Magistrate's ally. From now on, Elvermen can count on your loyalty. You give him your word as a nobleman. 
So he wants me to not do what Elborn wants and kind of where he's building up the common side. Elvermin doesn't want that at all. And I'm on his side in this because clearly I'm a scumbag. Splendid. I'm pleased to see I was right about you, Bronte. You'll make a marvellous prefect. But we have much work to do before we can accomplish this to our alliance. Also, he's promised me that I will become prefect if I help him, so, you know. Cheers to that. I'll see to your promotion, Niklaus. If you have any trouble, don't hesitate to contact me. But in order to make you prefect, we need to know all of Elborn's plans. He trusts your family. I'm sure it will be no trouble at all for you to obtain a better understanding of his affairs and gain access to his personal papers. I'll expect weekly reports from you. Go back. Go on with your work and maintain your position at the appropriate level. Remember that your every move is being watched. I hope you won't tarnish yourself by taking your cue from Elborn. But everything is much simpler once you've chosen your side once and for all, isn't it? You leave Elverman's estate. Your carriage slowly drives through the busy streets of Anazots. The sun is shrouded in clouds of dust. A sandstorm is approaching. Oh, sorry, Augustine. I got some justice up, though. Okay. This is definitely going the way I wanted it to go. It's not a good way. It's a very, very bad way. But I am, in fact, the bad guy in this situation, and that's okay. Because it also means that when all's said and done, I can send myself to the foot of the pillar. Which I shouldn't be as excited about as I am, but, you know, there we are. So Thomas has arrived in my office, and he needs help. Because Otten enjoys challenging his commanders to duels. Which he knows he'll win, because he is a master swordsman. He has already killed Thomas twice. He's challenged him to another duel, which Thomas knows he'll lose, which will be his third death. Thomas knows full well that when he comes back to life from his third death, he's going to be challenged again and then he's dead forever. So we can either agree to be Thomas's second for this duel so we go along and support him. We can decline Thomas's request, which does get us extra willpower. Which, you know what, I might do. Because my relation with Thomas doesn't matter. Either way, he's in danger. Yeah, and I get extra willpower. I'd rather not piss off Elborn any more than I've already pissed him off. So, yeah, Thomas can go by himself and deal with it. He's a big lad. He's bigger than me. What am I going to do? I'm just going to have to stand there and watch. I don't need that on my conscience. With a heavy sigh, you remind Thomas how you chose not to swear an oath you wouldn't be able to keep. You're no longer the boy next door who could help him out in a fight at a moment's notice. You're a prefect of judge now. Being his second in the duel would make you an accomplice to a crime. Thomas hears you out calmly. His bright eyes, however, grow more dull and dead with every word you utter. You're right, Bronte. Damn, you're always right. So, I guess I'm alone in this. Well, I didn't go to the military academy just to fear true death. Thomas bids you farewell, and the door closes behind him. Tomorrow, he will face certain death yet again. You're left alone in your quiet, empty office. Ho! The case against Austin. So, Elborn is... He's been wanting to build a case against Austin for a while, so he's decided to, that now is the time to start. Especially as he knows about Thomas. So we have a couple of options. We can let Thomas roam freely, which ups my career. But obviously Thomas is already in danger, it won't change that. We'll have Thomas taken into custody, which would reduce my reputation and my scheming. So, no. We're going to do what we did before, we let Thomas roam freely. We'll think, okay, he's out there, that's fine. We'll grab him if we need him but for now we need him out there we don't need Otten knowing that anything's up. Thomas is still in danger and my career is at level 9. The festival of the silver tree. A little family gathering on behalf of the silver tree and its named festival. Uh, Stefan is actually a pleasant human being. Gloria is grumpy so we can let Gloria read her poems and knock down unity. We can interrupt Gloria and knock down unity. I just will interrupt Gloria. We'll tell her to shut up because I feel like I can't really be nice to her after I've had her arrested. <laughs> a rendezvous with Octavia. So Octavia has summoned me, but she's a little bit distracted. There's something on her mind. So I can share my revelation with her, which is basically I'm relating the fact that I have died, what I saw when I died. Inquire about the arcane knowledge that she knows about, which increases theology and willpower. Or I can just get freaky. Let's get it on. That's what we did before, because, you know, willpower. It's time to kind of continue building the case against Lotten, so we've got a couple of options about how we can do that. Obviously, we can't ask Thomas for help gathering evidence because we don't have a good enough relationship, which is fine. We can ask, obviously, a Gaius Tempest for support, uh, which gets us the evidence. Search for evidence on my own, which I get, but then I die. Or I can not waste my time, which ups my career and my willpower. But now, the more I think about it, 
The more I think the Otten Faces Court of Honor is probably the best option, then I don't know. I kind of want to do that. Yeah, so we'll go for Ask Overseer, guys, for support. Why not? You were ennobled by the mantle, and only recently at that. Yet the Imperial Overseer should pay heed to your letter if your interests happen to align with his. The reputation of the Bronte family among the nobility of Margaret is high enough to make Gaius Tempest at least consider a petition from a young judge. You compose the letter to Gaius Tempest slowly and carefully, doing your best to avoid openly incriminating Otten. Through subtle hints placed here and there, you inform the Overseer that you might be useful to him in establishing order in the province as he sees fit and neutralising his opposition along the way. You're ready and willing to gather evidence that will implicate Otten in treason. All you need is the authority to represent the Overseer in this matter. At last, the letter is finished and sealed with the Bronte family crest, a branch of vert wrapped in a heavy chain. To your surprise, the Overseer's reply arrives just a few days later. Judge Bronte, your eagerness to serve the Overseer is praiseworthy indeed. One does not doubt the good intentions of the Bronte family, whose reputation precedes them. The future of the Empire rests upon the shoulders of the young nobles such as yourself. As the Supreme Commander of Margara, I cannot condone such lawless behaviour in my Legion. It is your duty to investigate the Legion officer tainted by such allegations, and no one may interfere with the performance of your duty. You will soon receive a document to the effect that you represent the interests of the Imperial Overseer in this investigation. However, do not make haste to publicise any evidence you might gather. This matter is too delicate to act recklessly. You will receive word when the time is right. From this moment on, Sir Bronte, the Imperial Overseer holds you personally responsible for this endeavour. With your authority thus expanded, you begin the investigation at once. The fierce of Gaius Tempest is enough to open doors and make people talk. No official employed by the Imperial Legion can refuse an inquiry made with the Overseer's authority. You soon learn the names of several Legion officers who have already met a lesser death in a duel with Otten, all of them nobles of the mantle, ennobled only recently young and full of potential to serve the good of the Empire. None of them are eager to speak of the duel, all of them are anxious to avoid getting challenged again. For many of them, another duel would be their last. They finally agree to have their statements committed to ink and paper only after you reassure them again and again that their testimony will put an end to Otten's murderous rampage. Their statements paint a picture. There's a method to Otten's madness, you realise. All of the officers disobey the commander at least once or express their disagreements, no matter how respectfully. More and more officers are starting to realise that Otten's loyalty lies with Archduke Melanidas and not his lawful superior, the Overseer. So more and more officers are getting challenged by Otten. Have Otten's duels gone beyond his passion for sword fighting? Were they just an excuse to eliminate any suspicion of his treason? Relatives of the officers who have met true death in a duel are the hardest to convince. Widows, mothers, fathers, they all say the same thing with the same grim expression. They have nothing to complain about. Nothing can be done anymore. The officer met his death in the line of duty, and that is all. But your persistence, and eventually you persuade them to admit that their husbands and relatives all met their end at Otten's hands. In all those jewels and deaths, you begin to notice a trend. None of them were sanctioned or monitored by the Court of Honour. Noble tradition demands that every sword fight be sanctioned by noble society and overseen by a representative of the Court of Honour. So Otten thinks himself above even the noble traditions of Arnold. The once thin folder against Otten grows fatter by the day as you write down every instance and incident, every name, every circumstance. One day, Prefect Elborn pays you a visit to see your progress firsthand. You show him the results, but wisely refrain from mentioning the aid you received from Gaius Tempest or the loyalty you have sworn to the Overseer in return. You've done great work, Bronte. I'm quite surprised you've managed to gather all this evidence on your own. Commander Otten isn't even bothering to cover his tracks, I must say. This evidence alone would be enough to indict anyone. Anyone saved from an Arcnian nobleman, sadly. So your work here is far from over, I see you realise that. The way things stand right now, summoning an Arcnian to trial in a court of law would indict us rather than him. It would be best to postpone the case for now, but keep the folder safe and secure. If we want to have any chance of getting him indicted in court, we need to make the nobles in the province recognise jewels as acts of murder. This means defying the traditions of old, a road perilous and seldom travelled. It means enforcing the rule of law over the Anazot gentry. But now, Sir Bronte, return to your other duties and pay particular attention to any duelling incidents. We will take our next steps against Sir Otten when the time is right. Okay, it does make sense in my in my narrative to do this, in my bad guy narrative, because Otten is treasonous against Tempest. I am all for the Empire, and that means I am all for Overseer Tempest. 
Uh, Stefan's Gambits. So he's going to try and marry Gloria off. I said no before because I didn't want to get involved and because it upped my unity. However, by not doing this, it then screwed my unity because he went and did it anyway. So am I better off doing it? Will I take a, a hit further on? I don't know. I'm going to agree and see what happens. I will agree to help him marry off Gloria. You remain silent for some time, weighing your decision. The plan your brother has proposed sounds reasonable. In a new family and with a new noble title, Gloria will be able to put all the resentment about her fate behind her and be free of the limitations of the lowly estate. You let Stefan know that you're on his side. A broad smile lights up his face as he reclines in his chair. I knew you'd be sensible. Together we can certainly make it happen. But remember how stubborn Gloria is. An easy victory is not to be expected. The next morning, you invite Gloria to join you in the library for a private conversation. You inquire carefully about your sister's thoughts on marriage. If a nobleman of the sword were to wed her, she would join the noble estate and all the arts would be open to her. Gloria laughs in response. Become a noblewoman. In all of Anazots, you'll never find a single nobleman of the sword who would ever marry a lowborn girl like me. I don't even have a father. You mention Jose El Pelletier. This spirited young gentleman would be willing to join Gloria in wedlock. Marry El Pelletier? Nicholas, you don't understand. Sure, he's easy on the eyes. He's a skilled warrior and a respected nobleman. But he's been after me for a year now, and I've managed to figure out what he's after. He needs a wife to give birth to his heirs, follow him around obediently at social gatherings and praise his chivalry. Can you see me in that role? Gloria falls silent for a moment, gathering her thoughts. Besides, I don't even want to be a noble woman, alright? I can't just live peacefully within the noble estate knowing that other commoners are still suffering. I can't just pretend their misery has nothing to do with me. You try to give her a taste of the benefits that a noble name brings, but your sister doesn't even want to hear it. This is all Stefan's idea, isn't it? You'd never throw me out of the house on your own, so hear this. It's not going to happen. Later, you inform Stefan of your sister's refusal. His face turns to stone. The ingrate. I have almost come to an agreement with old El Pelletier. All the plans we've taken to arrange her future and this is how she repays us? Well, we'll proceed without consulting her. Brother, we need to devise a way to put pressure on Gloria, even if it takes us a long time. Okay. Ooh, an audience with the Overseer. Interesting. This is new. Recent events have strengthened your position even further. Your authority among the judges is unchallenged. There's talk in noble circles to the effect that a nobleman with such respect for honour and tradition would be ideal for the post of prefect. You receive a letter early in the morning. The seal on the envelope is that of the Imperial Tempest Dynasty. Gaius Tempest himself, the overseer of the province and the emperor's brother, has summoned you to an audience with him. You are to head to his headquarters at the castle of Enere at once. Without delay, you send for a tailor and purchase a new suit in the latest fashion. A waistcoat, a shirt with a jabot, a long velvet coat fitted at the waist. You also go to the barber to make sure your appearance is impeccable. You are leaving Anazot. The journey to Enery is not a short one. You while away the time by observing the barren landscape and music. The overseer of Margaret himself wishes to see you in person. But why? All you can do is wait for the audience. Five days later, you arrive at your destination. The estate of Enery is remarkably prosperous for the desiccated province of Margra. Gaius Tempest's home has a truly Arcnean flair, a massive stronghold surrounded by imposing walls. It's set upon a rocky ledge and encircled by a moat with a stone bridge across it. You're expected to present yourself for an audience by noon. You enter a study. It's quite modestly decorated, by Arcnean standards. The most powerful Arcnean in Margaret is sitting at his desk, penning some ordinances. After finishing another line, he notices you. The scratching of his quill stops. Gaius Tempest has not changed since the time you saw him on the balcony of the Imperial Palace, celebrating the heir's coming of age. And now, the Overseer of Margra, scion of the Tempest dynasty and brother of the Emperor, stands before you. You offer a gracious bow. Gaius Tempest accepts your greeting with a favourable nod. I have heard of your family, Sir Nicholas Bronte, nobles of the mantle for two generations only, and already such recognition among noble society. Your work as a judge deserves respect as well. It seems you know how to choose your friends and allies. You assure the Overseer that you are flattered by his appreciation. You also remark that your principal allies are the law and your loyalty to the Empire. A faint grin passes over Gaius Tempest's exquisite features. Just as I thought. But one of those who must be your allies, Sir Elborn, has disappointed me of late. Please understand what I mean, Bronte. My Prefect is a talented and honest judge, but alas, he is also myopic and acts too hastily. 
firm power is needed to bring a positive change to the province. As for Elborn's escapades, he is playing with fire by expanding the rights of the Lowborn and aggravating the nobility. Change is out of the question as long as my legitimate authority in Marlborough can be challenged by that serpent Melanidas and his entourage. Because of his schemes, half of the old nobility have turned against him. The other half are people like Remy L. Vermin, who do not know what true loyalty is. Scoundrels like him never stay with the same master or ally for long. His only goal is to destroy his enemies, no matter the cost. But let us return to the question I brought you here to discuss. I am aware that you have begun legal proceedings against Commander Otten. He is among those who have chosen the wrong side in my dispute with the Archduke. I will not object if this impudent youth pays for his stubbornness, but please remember his noble blood. I cannot allow a highborn Archnean to be judged by the same court that reviews the petty grievances of the Lowborn. There are certain traditions that must remain inviolable. The case will not be adjudicated by the Prefecture. Otten must be handed over to a noble court of honor. It is not a question of justice. By killing my legion soldiers, Otten has insulted me personally. In a court of honor, I'll be able to deal with Otten properly, Archnian to Archnian. But only if you, Bronte, can gather sufficient proof and occupy such a position that not only I, but all the other nobles must heed your advice. I need a personal ally at the prefecture. If you prove to be useful to me, you will become a member of the entourage of Overseer Gaius of the Tempests. In order to give you a free hand, I will order you to be promoted to the rank of Senior Judge. You have already shown yourself to be worthy of the title. But remember, you are henceforth loyal to me personally, and not Prefect Elborn. Gaius Tempest gestures to a sealed envelope on his desk. This is the decree ordering your promotion. But remember that Otten must not stand trial in a Prefecture Court. The only judgement awaiting him is my own. May I assume that we are clear, Sir Bronte? Gaius Tempest watches you intently. His cold stare is difficult to endure. The Overseer is not accustomed to being refused. But are you willing to accept his proposal? Okay, so that ups my career by too much. But I feel I'm going to need to do it anyway. In fact, obviously, I have to do it. It's the only legitimate, well, it's the only logical thing I can do. You swear allegiance to the Overseer and agree to hand Otten over to the Court of Honor instead of sentencing him yourself. Cool, and hopefully I'll be able to knock down justice by one, uh, career by one. Your head bowed, you accept the envelope. You promise the Overseer that you will carry out his orders. Gaius Tempest reclines in his chair with a satisfied air. I expect nothing less. You have risen high, Bronte. You have the patronage of a noble Archnian from the Tempest dynasty. Do not let me down. Otten must fall. Gather evidence and prepare your case, but remember your place in this affair. It is a dispute between two Archneans, not a human trial. It's time for my midday meal. You will depart first thing tomorrow, but you will spend the night in our castle. You leave for Anazot the next morning. Rumours about your audience with the Overseer make their way through every noble household. Becoming a senior judge is a big deal. Prefect Elborn receives the news of your promotion with the utmost surprise, but fulfills Gaius Tempest's requests without any objection. <laughs> Traditionally, a promotion is an occasion that's cause for a celebration. Your family funds must shoulder this burden, such is the custom. Your grandfather, Gregor Bronte, is the only other member of the family to hold such a lofty position in the prefecture. The celebration attracts all of Anazot High Society. Among the other guests, Magistrate L. Vermin pays you a visit. The celebration is in full swing when Remy L. Vermin takes the stage. My dear Nicholas, allow me to congratulate you on becoming a senior judge. I am glad to see this post filled by a real nobleman who has respect for our traditions. You may not have been born a nobleman, but you have become one. But you mustn't rest on your laurels. Instead of truly dispensing justice, many judges prefer to interfere with the lives of Anazot's most esteemed citizens. I'm sure you will find a way to put them in their place. A toast to the new heights for Senior Judge Bronte. The magistrate's speech is met with applause. Meanwhile, the seat reserved for Prefect Elborn is empty. He has chosen not to come at all. Gaius Tempest is right. You've risen high. But the higher the ascent, the more deadly the fall. Otten's case has turned into something more. A struggle for power in the province. You must be careful. With that thought, you empty your glass. Okay. I'm thinking it's looking more and more likely like Night of the Serpents is going to happen. Which was my original goal, but... Often faces the Court of Honor is still good, so I will try and knock my career down if I can, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. But for now, a realm unknown. We have received a letter, well, Elborn has received the letter and he's handed the case to us. 
basically there has been a report of a heretical society which could be plotting against the Overseer, and there is somebody from the Archduke Circle involved. So we go to investigate, and it turns out to be the the Lotari Circle. So obviously Octavia's there being the leader of the Lotari. So we can either keep their secret, which gets me the Lotari Ritual Destiny, uh, but knocks down my justice, ban the circle, which knocks down my reputation, so no, or legitimize the circle, which does increase my wealth. I may legitimize the circle in that case, which I have done before. And that's fine. I don't need the Lotari Ritual. I will need that on another playthrough that I want to do. But for now, we'll legitimize the circle like we did before. So they can keep their silly little gathering. Threats and promises. We have been summoned to City Hall by L. Vermin, who needs an urgent meeting with us. And when we get there, Doris Otten is also there. And he is pissed about the fact that we're building a case against him and wants us to stop immediately. So I can put him at ease. I can retaliate, which ups my reputation, but I die. Uh, seek Sir L. Vermin's protection, which ups my diplomacy. Would give Otten my word. Uh, which does knock my career down, which I need to do. Swear an oath to the Arkney and you'll do everything you can to keep this case from progressing. Which technically, I will. Because I don't want it to go to the Prefecture. I want it to go to the Noble Court. And I don't like him anyway, so I can have no issue with lying to him. But at the same time, reputation. I'm going to retaliate. I'll take the death and I'll take the reputation. So this is what we did before. So we tell him, no sir we will be doing this and he proceeds to stab me to death classic otten reaction okay so my reputation is eight i have now died twice and i've still got 20 willpower though so that's that's good that's not too shabby we have been summoned to a crime scene there is a an illegal duel has taken place and a nobleman has stabbed another nobleman and obviously the other nobleman has died to their true death which is why we have been summoned uh, so, we have a few options about how we can deal with El Corvio. We can fine him, which ups my career. We can sentence him to capital punishment, which knocks down my career, but increases my wealth. Hmm. I'm going to do this. I'm going to sentence El Corvio to capital punishment, which is what I did before. Uh, so, as it says, I literally sentence him to be... I'm pretty sure he gets beheaded, which is pretty harsh, but he's kind of a scumbag, so I'm fine with that. Cool. So, yeah, I write to Octavia and say, can you please support me in this? And she says, oh... My human Nicklaus, anything for you? Yes. And El Corvio loses his head. And my career goes down a little bit. Everybody wins, except for El Corvio. He doesn't. Uh, the hunt for Thomas. So Thomas sends us a letter saying uh, that it's time he's being hunted. This is it. He's about to die his true death. Can we help him? So I can protect him, which no. No, for the willpower drop alone, Thomas, no. Uh, by willpower drop alone, I of course mean reputation drop alone. Uh, no, I'm not getting involved. Thomas, you can die your true death. Good night, sweet prince. Sorry, I love you. 25 willpower. Hot diggity. Oh, my favourite character. The first character I hated nearly as much as Sir Gregor Bronto. Philippe El Ferro. So he has come along one day and said that he works for the secret... The secret? The secret chancellery. He works for the secret chancellery. And he's been hunting the last straw, which we know he hasn't. He's been crafting the last straw, but an explosion's gone off. And he has a list of people that he believes are involved and needs them to be rounded up ASAP. We can protect the people on the list, which drops my career and reputation. I can conduct an investigation, which ups my career, which I don't want. I'm thinking I'm going to have to protect the people on the list. So career, career drops down to seven. Reputation drops to seven. Unity does go up to six, though. And blah, blah, blah. Ooh, 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 ooh. Actually, yes, because I have the evidence against Otten. It brings the justice requirements down. Cool. So being at seven is probably okay. Because then if I build it back up again, that's good. Cool. So we'll do exactly the same as we did before. We will protect the people on the list. We send the gendarmes out to protect the houses. And then when the secret chancellery come to try and grab them, we go, no, no, no. no. Not today. And El Faro doesn't like it one little bit. That's fine, because I don't like him one little bit. Okay, Unity's in a pretty strong position. Just need to, it's that reputation. I just need to get the reputation up a little bit. The Rebel. This is new. A year has passed since Stefan engaged you in his scheme to marry Gloria off. 
and yet you've had no chance to influence your obstinate sister. Tempers are running high in your household. Gloria disappears for days at a time. She's often seen in the company of young commoners. Father constantly lectures Gloria, telling her that her friends are libertines and troublemakers. Connections like these will be her downfall. Your sister listens obediently, then vanishes again. Tonight, Stefan meets you by the door, looking distressed. Niklaus, I've been waiting for you for quite some time. Let's go to the garden and talk in private. It's about Gloria. You sit on a shady bench. A hot, dry wind is blowing. I was on my way to a ball in the El Liberius mansion. I was already on their doorstep when a servant told me he'd been ordered to turn me away. They will not have anything to do with a family who offspring is a member of a secret society. Oh, we have had this before. I can't remember it, but I know we've had this. I'm certain they meant Gloria, and these are not mere rumours. You know full well that she's entirely capable of such a thing. And here I was wondering where our little rebel spends all her time. We have to act, brother. Any delay in the damage to our family will be irreparable. We have to make Gloria stop these escapades and get married by any means necessary. A secret society represents a tangible threat to our family. Father will see that and side with us, but still, I will not accuse Gloria without firm evidence. That would be dishonourable. My hope lies with you, Niklaus. You're admitted to the right circles and Gloria still trusts you, though she fears and loathes me. The two of you play together as children so often, you should be able to strike the right time with her. Find a way to tame Gloria and force her to get married. Remember, we are doing this for the House of Bronte, as well as for her own goods. The hot wind scorches your face mercilessly. You're lost in thoughts. Okay, so influence Gloria through mother or reject the plan. Okay, well, I have to do it through mother then, I guess, because I don't want to reject it. So we'll see. You find mother in her chambers. Her health is improving with each passing day. You sit down on the edge of her bed and ask her how she feels. Oh, you know, son, as the years go by, our stairs have seemed steeper and steeper. But today I walked downstairs for lunch all by myself. Gloria and I had a long walk around the garden before she left. Is she back yet? You carefully ask her if she knows where Gloria went. Mother frowns. Uh, to, to the market, or, or was it the weavers? I, I'm not sure. You softly tell mother that Gloria is in trouble. She's gotten herself involved with some dangerous people, conspirators. She must be rescued as soon as possible. <laughs> oh my, are you certain, son? Could it have really gone that far? Might they not just be fellow poets? They're libertines and they don't observe their lot, but they'd never take up arms. You insist. There can be no doubt. Gloria has joined a secret society, and before she commits an offence against the authorities, it's your duty to bring her back to safety. Mother agrees with a tired air. You've always taken good care of this family, Niklaus. Now you're right. And now you're right about this too. I raised her. I taught her. I did my best. Was it all for nothing? What do we do now, son? You tell her about the plan to give Gloria to Sir El Politier in marriage. At first, Mother is incredulous. A nobleman of the sword is willing to marry my illegitimate daughter Gloria? The twin gods must be watching over her. But you do realise that she'll rebel against it, don't you? And it would be so sad for me to give her away to another family. You assure Mother that if she does not get married, Gloria's escapades will not ruin only her life, but also the Bronte family. The same family that gave them both shelter and the life of ease. Mother and Gloria must repay father's kindness, even if being a nobleman's wife is not exactly what Gloria wishes. Mother's face darkens, her eyes are suddenly sharp. She speaks clearly and distinctly. My daughter and I will do our duty to the house of Bronte. Do not doubt us, son. Mother spends the rest of the day in prayer. When Gloria finally comes home, they have a long conversation upstairs in mother's chambers. You hear pleading and weeping coming from that room. The next morning, when you're gathered around the table, Gloria rises to her feet. Her face is still red and swollen from a tearful night. Noble Sirs Bronte, I, Gloria, lowly daughter of Lady Lydia, hereby consent to become the wife of Sir El Pelletier and will no longer impose myself upon you. I am grateful to this house for everything I have received here. I do not wish to be a burden anymore and tarnish the Bronte name. I do not deserve to be among you. Your father is horrified. Mother nods sadly. Stefan jumps to his feet. Gloria, you have mustered the strength to act valiantly. You are dear to our hearts, but we must part ways for the common good. Let us hear nothing more of shame. A family of the highest nobility and a happy husband await you. You will be married to a nobleman of the sword. I'll send a letter to Jose El Pelletier at once. Gloria responds to Stefan with a wry smile. Your sister casts an intense look around the room. Who else was behind the scheme to marry her off? Gloria's eyes fix on you. You hold her stare without flinching. Oh, Jesus. Well, hopefully... I mean, the reputation's going to take a hit when 
Oh, sorry, Unity's going to take a hit when Mama dies, because I don't have a high enough Unity to save her. But hopefully Gloria will get married, and that won't impact Unity. Hopefully she doesn't run away again. Overseer Gaius Tempest has swung by Elborn's office for a visit. The last straw is becoming a lot more of a problem, and some Legion troops were on the hunt for some last straw, last straw soldiers, Sophia included, and then all of a sudden an Arcanian came out of the shadows and killed the Legion soldiers and helped them escape. So now we have to find him and arrest him, and this is our chance, if we were to be doing this this way, of setting the precedent of having an Arcanian put through the courts this way. So, I mean, I can literally... Oh no! That's not good. All I can do is acquit him and clear all charges, which I thought was going to be the best option. Oh shit. Because before I turned to Octavia for aid. Oh, it's because my relation with Melanidas is minus one. Okay, well, I'm going to have to acquit him and hope that I can somehow get a plus two in career in the next few steps. Oh dear. Oh dear. You loudly call for attention. Some time passes before you restore order in the courts and continue your opening remarks albeit with a sudden, unexpected twist. There has been a misunderstanding, you say. Indeed, Sir Anthony Fess engaged in combat with Legion soldiers, but only because their brazen behaviour left him no choice but to defend his honour. Naturally, you say, the insurgents were not involved in any way. There can be no doubt that no Arcnir of noble birth would ever defy the sacred rule of the Emperor. Surely the Honourable Board of Judges would agree. The nobles in the courtroom, left stunned and speechless by the young Arcnian's words a moment ago, seem to awaken from their daze. They applaud you. Here, here, they cry. Hands off the Arcnians. Only Octavia Melanidas remains silent in the back row, her face contorted in a disdainful smirk. Anthony Fess looks around the courtroom, dumbfounded. He tries to speak again, but you cut him off before he can even begin. You continue your speech. This young Arcnian nobleman has allowed his roiling ancient blood and desire for greatness to speak louder than reason. We should not misinterpret this youthful fervour as treason. Anthony Fess is clearly innocent and must be freed at once. Your speech concluded, you catch your breath, and when you look up, your eyes meet Elborn's heavy, scornful gaze, devoid of all respect. The prefect sighs, painfully, grievously, and reaches for his gavel. Due to the absence of any charges, the court has no choice but to find Sir Anthony Fess not guilty. You are free to go, but remember the laws of the Empire represent the will of our Emperor and the twins themselves. The aristocracy applauds this just verdict from the stalls. The gendarmes hurry the rebellious Arcnian out of the courtroom before he can utter another word. The prefect walks down from the podium, his eyes trained on you, full of sugar in. Not only have you let me down, Bronte, you've also shown everyone that Arcnians are above the law, even if they commit crimes out in the open. I had hoped that this outrageous call for rebellion would finally force an Arcnian to face justice, yet the aristocracy would rather tolerate a singular madman's revolt than risk their immunity from the legal process. Fortunately for you, the Prefect is quickly surrounded by nobles. Excited by the case of Anthony Fess, they have questions that demand answers. You slip out of the courtroom, only to run into a crowd of commoners, but to your surprise, they shower you with adoring cries. All hail Judge Bronte, they shout. He saved good Sir Fess. The news that you've rescued the sole Arcnian fighting for the Lowborn is quick to spread across all of Anazot. A letter arrives almost immediately after the trial bearing the Overseer's seal. Gaius Tempest makes no attempt to conceal his anger. Entrusting this case to you was a mistake, Judge. You failed to resolve it in a worthy fashion. Anthony Fass is now at large, free to rouse the people to revolt as he pleases. But do not blame yourself. It is my fault for assigning a delicate matter of such importance to a man who was but recently a commoner. You let out a heavy sigh. It seems everyone in Margaret has their own reason to condemn your decision. Oh shit. Oh shit. Hmm. This is not what I wanted to happen. Oh, and now Mummy's going to die. Accept the loss. Take the hit on Unity. Ugh, and the minus 10 willpower. Ugh. Transformation. So, we receive a letter from the Melanodasses, and they say, we're aware of your relationship with our daughter, but this is not a letter about that. She has gone missing. We need to find her immediately. So, we think, okay, what do we know? We haven't seen her for a while, but we know about the Lothari. So, we hunt her down. And she is in the midst of transforming, which is the ritual where she's basically going to kill herself and she will be reborn as Latarian. So we arrive to see her lying in a pool of her own blood. She disappears, but she returns as ex-Octavia, 
so she returns in Latarian form. So I can demand that Octavia be returned to her family, which gets my reputation back up. Uh, let the Latari go, which knocks it down, or accept your beloved's transformation, which uh, again knocks me down. So I am going to demand that Octavia be returned to her family, which is what I did before. Cool. So that gets my reputation back up to eight, which is good. The Gilded Cage. Uh, Gloria's wedding day. She is not happy about it one little bit, but she is off to marry Sir Jose El Pelletier. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I didn't realise this was going to prop up at this stage. I wondered when this was going to crop up. But now Gloria has gone, that issue with the family is resolved. Stefan's like, ah, oh, brilliant. He wants to several ties with Gloria and take his place as the heir of the Bronte family. Or settle into his position as heir of the Bronte family. So we can sever all ties with Gloria, which I don't want to do, but it does boost my reputation. I can maintain family ties with Gloria, which boosts unity but knocks down reputation. Or I can challenge Stefan to a duel, which does neither. You deny your elder brother's right to rule the family. Your dispute must be settled by the sword. So I'm already thinking that there's a chance I'm going to have to restart this chapter because I've screwed everything anyway. So I'm kind of with where my career is currently at. So I'm going to challenge Stefan to a duel. Sure. You rise from your seat, your eyes trained on Stefan. Your elder brother glares at you in confusion. Your words come out one by one, like nails into the lid of a coffin. Who says Stefan has the right to decide what your family says or does? You'll never agree to give him full control over the family's affairs. You too are a nobleman, and your lot is to rule. Why should you bend to Stefan's will? Stefan leaps to his feet, indignant. I hold myself responsible for our family's good name. But you, Niklaus... You wormed your way into the nobility, but you have no idea what nobility means. You're living proof that noblemen are born, not made. But you've forgotten that father is observing you, and he is furious. The Klaus is right, Stefan. You've gone too far. Gloria can do nothing to harm our family standing now, and yet you are dead set on cutting all ties with her. This is not nobility, it is obsession. It's time you remembered I am head of this household. You are not Gregor Bronte, and you never will be. Stefan's face grows crimson. He can barely contain his rage. If you cannot keep the family in check and defend our honor, Father, then I'll have to do it myself. This is it. The moment you've been waiting for. You cut Stefan off. He's left you no choice. You will not let him rule over this family with an iron fist. And if your brother won't listen to words, your swords can do the talking. You challenge your elder brother to a duel. Father is at a loss for words. Even Stefan is stunned at first, but quickly regains his composure. Sir Nicolas Bronte, I accept your challenge. We shall duel to the true death. Hey, oh, hey, hang on. Hang on a minute. Father intervenes. His shock gives way to fury. This is madness. My son's fighting to the death. Never. Stefan moves away from father, cold and indifferent. The honour of our family is at stake. I see no one's willing to relent. Why continue this dispute? We must settle this once and for all. I forbid it. As your father and as a prefecture judge. Calm yourself, father. My honour is mine alone. You have no claim to it. Brother, we shall duel tomorrow at sunrise in the barren field by the city wall. Be ready. With a sharp turn, Stefan strides out of the room, perfectly composed. Father grows pale. He collapses into his armchair and buries his face in his arms. It's time to prepare for the duel. Only one of you is coming back. Holy shit, I didn't realise that it was a duel to the death. Good lord. Kind of always wanted to stab Stefan in the face, so... Why not now? To the death. <laughs> it's early in the morning and dreadfully windy. In a barren field by the city wall, two lonely figures approach one another. You and Stefan face each other, swords at the ready. Stefan glares at you. There's sadness in his eyes. Quite the twist of fate. It seems I've learned to fence only to fight my own little brother. <laughs> Remember how you hit me hard with a stick when we were boys? and your mother scolded you for brandishing a weapon. Who knew it was all leading to this? You regret what's about to happen, you reply, but this is the only way your conflict can be resolved. Stefan nods gloomily. Childhood memories cloud your faces, playing, fighting, tending to fence. It takes you both an effort to remain in the presence. The cloaks come off. Ceremonious bows are exchanged. You can both sense the shades of your Bronte ancestors watching you. A sacred ritual is underway. For noblemen, there is no higher judgment. Your duel to the true death begins. Your brother wastes no time opening with a flurry of strikes. 
His skill and mastery is truly commendable. You dodge, parry, and block, but Stefan keeps driving you back. The morning air is cool, yet your dress shirt is already soaked in sweat. The tip of his blade slashes and weaves through the air, almost invisible to the eye. Stefan is wearing you down. You can't last long like this. Sweat is streaming down your forehead now. Your tired muscles ache and seize. Your brother's first blow lands. A glancing cut. A blood red line on your sleeve. You grit your teeth. You began studying swordplay too late, brother. You've only been defending so far, but now you notice that Stefan is growing exhausted himself. When the time is right, you go on the counter-attack. But now you are the one showering him with a flurry of blows. Your older brother is stepping back, surprised by your onslaught. A jab. Another. You take another swing with your trusty blade. Ha! Stefan deflects your blow with an artful feint and moves swiftly to your side. Your foe is on your left now. You are defenseless. Stefan's blade rises. You have but one moment to act before he does. Your life and your brother's are hanging by a thread. So, oh, what? Overcome death. Hmm. So I can parry. Yeah, this is... This is... Not good. Either way, I mean, either way, I become the heir, which is kind of what I wanted out of this. <sighs> okay, this boosts my scheming. <laughs> it's a shitty way of doing it, but I'm going to resort to dirty tricks. Resort to a dirty trick. You'll do whatever it takes to leave this jewel alive. Okay, this is absolutely annihilating my chances of becoming a noble, but... It's okay. It's okay. An unexpected thought pierces through your mind. You can never best your brother in a fair fight. If you want to be the one left standing, you need to resort to trickery. The tip of Stefan's blade slices through the air above you. Stefan lowers his sword and steps closer. What foolishness is this, Niklaus? Stand up and fight! Stefan is waiting for you to get up. His defence is completely lowered. It's now or never. You begin to rise, then immediately stab him from below. Yeah, that's a real dick move. The blow hits home. Your sword runs through your brother's chest. Stefan staggers backwards, a look of surprise on his face. A strange gurgling noise comes out of his throat as he falls to his knees. His eyes grow dim. The tiniest red dot blots his dress shirt. Stefan's lips move. His voice is less than a whisper. A vile trick. You know nothing of honour. You're no brother of mine. Disgust contorts his lips and his face loses all colour. You keep listening, but there are no more words now. Only his breathing, weak and hoarse. Stefan falls prone on the cold, hard ground, coughing up blood, convulsing, shaking. Then, at last, he grows still. Stefan Bronze, your elder brother, has died his true death by your hand. You take Stefan's lifeless body home. He will rest in the family crypt now. Stefan's soul will join your family's blood tide, an unseen spectre watching over all of you. The home is quiet. Silence rings in your ears. Father awaits you at the door, his face a frozen mask of grief and pain. So you are the one who has returned. I have no words, Niklaus. A long moment passes before Father speaks again. But never mind, son. You are my favourite. Stefan was a shit. If only I knew your horror it would cost me one of my sons. Oh, I should have you arrested for an attempted duel. But Stefan would never have allowed that. Twins, damn it. Father collapses in an armchair, hiding his face in his hands. It takes some time before he has enough strength to speak again. But there's nothing that can be done now. The judgement of noble honour has been rendered. We must accept this loss. I have lost my firstborn son. My heir. Very well, Niklaus. You are now the family's eldest son and the heir of the Bronte family. Remember this. You are now responsible for the fate of our family. Or what's left of it. I mean, I've been responsible this entire time. I just now have the title to prove it. You withdraw to your room, wash the blood off your shoulder, and collapse onto the bed. You're overwhelmed by memories. You remember your brother leading you by the hand through the yard. You remember sitting at the big table of the porch, poking each other in the arm. You remember marching through the streets of Anazot at night looking for Gloria. You remember Stefan embracing you tightly when you returned from the capital. Soon, you see Stefan for the last time at his funeral. Your elder brother's body is now gone forever, reposing in the depths of the crypt. Did he reach the peak of the Shining Pillar, or was he doomed to suffer at the foot for all eternity? Your family is quiet. They will not meet your eyes. Ho! Shit! Unity is bad! Real, real bad. Nathan's repentance. So we find Nathan in father's office holding a dagger, and he is planning on killing himself so he can see the twins. 
to ask them what he needs to do with his life. I mean, all I can do is not stop Nathan. Man, how is my... I went into this with full willpower. How is my willpower now nothing? <laughs> Good God. So we'll let Nathan kill himself and he'll get his answers. But I have lost all willpower. Good Lord, how have I gone from 30 to zero? That's shocking. And I don't think I'm going to get my career back up to where it needs to be. Also, how have I not got an achievement for becoming heir? That should have been an achievement. God damn it. Everything was good, apart from unity that took a hit. Fine, we're going to sever all ties with the family again. It's knocks down my willpower again. Son of a bitch. I mean, it's literally just me, Father, and Nathan left anyway. We're a ragtag bunch. Okay, so final preparations for the meeting. Ah! <laughs> Ah, uh, I mean, even if I could have done that, if I had the willpower to start a rumour among the aristocracy, that wouldn't have got me enough. And bide my time. It gives me willpower, but it doesn't benefit me any other way. We'll see how this trial plays out then, I guess. So, as we're kind of preparing everything, uh, Doris Otten appears and asks, well, tells me to burn the case, or he will start stabbing bitches. So all I can do is burn the case. I want to see how this plays out, actually. I mean, because it's not, it's not gone well for me. You stare out the window helplessly. All these years of service as a judge spent trying to achieve balance, siding with the common estate while avoiding the ire of the mighty, gathering influence and climbing higher while doing your duty as a judge. You've been buffeted by twists of fate, by schemes and plots, and you have failed to maintain that fragile balance. You have failed to protect justice in your home province. The common people are so desperate that they're ready to take rights by force, but the law is too weak to govern commoners nobles and the Archeans alike. You will not be able to convict Otten, no matter how many crimes he's committed. The grip of tradition is too strong. The Archeans are and will remain immune to the rule of law. On the other hand, you've also failed to garner enough influence to establish enough connections within the aristocracy. You've not earned the respect or curried their favour. Without powerful patrons, Otten, your sworn enemy, cannot be defeated. There's only one thing left to do. Acquiesce to Otten's demands. Your hands shake as you collect the papers on Otten's case in your office. You walk down the stairs to the door of the prefecture. Otten meets you face to face. He dismounts his horse, but clad in a full suit of ancient armour, the Archean is still a head taller than you. There you are, at last, Bronte. I expected nothing less. You humans are predictably apt at finding your proper place soon enough. Now destroy those despicable scribbles. A legion soldier hands you a burning torch. Humble and obedient, you bring the fire closer to the papers containing Otten's case. All the evidence you have, all your statements, it all burns away in an instant. The wind lifts the ashes and scatters them across the square. This is what you should have done the moment your upstart of a prefect instructed you to undertake this so-called case. Still, my mercy is known far and wide. Confess your lies and slander to the entire city and you will be forgiven. Your stomach roils, it's hard to breathe. It takes all the effort you can muster to take a deep breath. Then you do as he asks. You submit to the highborn Archeans' truth. You gathered slanderous rumours, a task beneath a true noble's honour. Did everyone hear that? That's enough, Bronte. You're free to go. Turn to your cases of petty theft and stolen trinkets, and don't meddle in the affairs of your betters. Otten springs back into the saddle and commands the battalion return to the barracks. You remain in the square, unmoving, your spirit broken. From behind you, Elborn's hand comes to rest on your shoulder. Hey, Klaus, you, you did all you could. It pains me to say it, but we cannot bring Otten to justice, or make all the estates equal under the law. We must accept this defeat. We weren't ready. I am so sorry for getting you involved in this hopeless case. I wanted to change the Empire, but instead I doomed you to humiliation. I fear Otten's case was our last and only chance to avert a riot in Anazot. Soon the human's patience will run out, and they will explode in defiance of this lawless tyranny and no one will be able to prevent the fire and blood. You may go, Bronte. Brace yourself for the tough times ahead. Take care. Elborn embraces you like a father and drags himself back into his office. You watch him leave, a lonely, bent old man. The sky over Anazot splits apart, showering the dust-covered streets with long-awaited rain. Ho! Oh, well, I got an achievement! A lesson writ in blood. The night is grey, miserable and gloomy. You walk down the steps of the prefecture, dragging your feet to your carriage. Now that Otten's case has met an ignoble end, your sense of duty seems to be the only thing keeping you at the office. Cases, complaints, petition, it's all a blur. Another day has ended. Anazot is growing more restless by the day. The commoners cannot endure the tyranny and humiliation of the nobles any longer. 
more and more of them are refusing to obey, taking up arms and gathering in the squares. The noble militia of Anazot is making preparations to suppress the riots. The new believers are marching through the city. The last straw insurgents continue to incite unrest, striking again and again. It pains you to think that you could have made a difference if only you had not lost against Otten. A voice you don't recognise calls out to you. As you turn around to look, something heavy hits you on the head. The world grows dark before your eyes. Another blow lands, this time in your stomach. You fall to the ground, gasping for air, as pain and nausea crumble your body into a tight ball. Your ears are ringing so loudly you can barely hear the voices above you, but you still recognise your assailants as legion officers. They bind your wrists and ankles and put a sack over your head. A carriage arrives. They drag you inside and shove you onto the seats. You're alone with the squeaky wheels and the clacking of hooves. You hear the city gate open. They're taking you out of the city. They drag you out of the carriage and remove the sack. You find yourself on waste ground outside the city limits, lit by the torches and surrounded by silhouettes. You recognise a number of aristocrats. Magistrate Remy L. Vermin is here, as is Friedrich L. Labirius, head of the noble militia. So many people you have angered. But the biggest silhouette of them all belongs to Dorius Otten, who stands right before you. How was the trip, Sir Nicolaus Bronze? I took the liberty of sending my personal carriage to pick you up. I didn't want you to miss our appointment. Otten leans down to you and looks you in the eye. I remember you as a young boy. I remember how insolent you were even back then. I knew we'd fight one another eventually. Well, that time has come. Surely you didn't expect me to forgive your insult just like that, did you? You renounced my case, yeah. But my honour is an arcane and demands satisfaction. You've done more than merely insult my bloodline. You've questioned the power of those who rule this world. You're all alone. No one will protect you. You knew what you were doing, Bronte, and now you're going to pay. I challenge you to a duel. Court of Honour hereby accepts the challenge. Sir Otten may rightfully defend his honour in a duel to the true death. Both parties shall fight blindfolded. What? That seems unfair. Otten takes off his jacket and draws his sword. He's clearly done this many times before. A blindfold is placed over his eyes. Your head is covered by the same sack, this time not entirely around your neck. Dorius of the Otten Dynasty and Nicolaus of the Bronte Bloodline will now cross swords in mortal combat. I summon their ancestors to bear witness to their duel. May their blood tides meet in sacred battle and determine the truth. May the younger witness our trial and behold the power of his inevitable law. A hand shoves a sword into yours. You can barely breathe through the thick sackcloth. Your hands are shaking, unwilling to fight. You probe the darkness with the tip of your blade, unsure of where to strike. Let the battle begin! Your arms grow tired. The sword feels incredibly heavy and unwieldy. You fall silent, trying to hear your enemy moving. Something rustles ahead. You step back as soon as you hear it, holding the blade in front of you. Still trying to run from me, eh, Bronte? I'm afraid it's too late for that. You swing at the voice, but your blade slices nothing but air. You take a quick hop backwards. Your head shrinks into your shoulders. You can't allow yourself to breathe, waiting for another strike. Don't listen to him. Surprised by the voice, you take a deep breath. The steel band you'd felt around your chest is suddenly shattered. You cannot possibly defeat him, but you can accept your death with dignity. Prove you're worthy of the Bronte name. You square your shoulders. The rope around your neck bothers you no longer. You still can't see a thing, but you have no need for sight now. Keep your feet steady. Get your sword up. I'm here for you. A step, a swing, a jab. You know where to strike. Your blade sinks into flesh. Ugh, pathetic human runts. That's it. I'm done playing with you. Something slices through the air. You deflect it. Again, once more. You're not in command of the blade. The blade commands you. You feel the blade swing in front of your face. You move to parry it, but your sword meets nothing. And then his sword stabs you straight in the heart. Oh man, you gotta dangle that in front of me like it wasn't gonna kill me. You bastards. You take a few slow steps back. The darkness in your eyes gives way to light. A light brighter than anything you have ever seen before. You keep the sword in your hands until the very last moment. You die on your feet. All is well, Niklaus. Come to me. Oh, good lord. Uh, we kind of kind of figured that true death was happening at this point. Neither side could overcome the other. The fire of the revolt could not be extinguished. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, 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 we know this. So that's the, like, wasteland, everybody loses outcome. But no, no, no. Back to peacetime. So my downfall was pissing off Archduke Melanidas. That was my stumbling block. Because that was minus one, I couldn't ask Octavia to help, which knocked my career down by two, which screwed me. So I need to... I'm going to replay everything exactly the same, apart from that one decision. I can't remember what that one decision was, but when I get to it, I'll include you in the process. But until then... I mean, no time's going to pass for you. It's, I'm talking to myself at this point. It was a gift for the family that did it. It's because we declined the gift. It's because I took unity over reputation. Damn it. <laughs> okay, so we'll give the jewels to the prominent nobles as gifts, which is going to bump our reputation to nine, which is good. It's very, very good. Okay, so we'll do that, which we've done before. If anything changes between now and the point I needed this stat change, I will bring us back to that point, but if not, I'm going to cut everything else out. An interesting development. Because of that one change that I did, my reputation is now at 10, which means, in theory, this should trigger an event. So let's see. No, it hasn't. Damn it. Fine. Hey, there we go. It has. It just didn't do it when I was expecting it to. That was a fun little jingle. Recent events have cemented the noble reputation of the Bronte family. Now every elite family in Anazot respects your name and holds you in high regard. Your actions speak for themselves. Your reputation is spotless. You will know the traditions of the Empire. The noble families have come to rely on your word. The Brontes are now the most honourable of the newly formed bloodlines. You have not earned a hereditary title? Yes. Pretty sure that should be yet. But the city's nobles are all but certain that you will be a noble by the sword very soon. Your name is often mentioned to oversee a Gaius Tempest, along with the highest praise. Marvellous. Oh, achievement! Love it. What a happy accident. Perfect. So we're on justice for all, and I can turn to Octavia for aid, which is what we did before, which is going to put my career precisely where it needs to be. Well, smack bang in the middle of where it needs to be, anyway. So, good. Okay, so this time in the on the Gilded Cage, so Gloria's wedding day. So instead of challenging Stefan to a duel, I can afford to take the hit in reputation now. So I'm going to maintain family ties with Gloria. But again, unity, I think it's still going to be too low. Slowly, you rise from your seat and shake your head at Stefan's words. Your elder brother glares at you in confusion. You assail Stefan's confidence with a long, fervent speech. Gloria lived in this home for so many years. She grew up with you and shared your joys and sorrows. She's your mother's daughter. Cutting all ties with her would be cowardly and bring disgrace to your name. Gloria may be a child of lowly birth who does not belong to your blood side, but family ties go beyond mere blood and social standing. How could you even think of erasing her from your memory as though she never existed? Gloria used to be a permanent fixture in this house, I can't deny that. But that time has passed. It's blood that unites a family. There's no blood, there's nothing to talk about. You fold your arms on your chest before offering a retort. No, you aided Stefan and got Gloria to agree to the wedding but also had a say in your sister's future, and now you must have a say in your family's treatment of her. And you say that the family will remain in touch with Gloria. Stefan needn't fear any harm or dishonour from that. She belongs to another bloodline now. The Brontes are safe from scandal. So be it. We'll stay in touch with Gloria. You're right, she's no threat to us anymore. Now take your glass, Nicklaus. A toast to the future of the Bronte family. You clink glasses. You note a hint of bitterness in the flavour of the mulled wine. Anyway. Time to get down to business. I'll head to the Overseer's residence at once. We're so close to earning a hereditary title, brother. Now our grandfather will be so proud of us. With that, Stefan leaves you alone. Father's locked himself in his office to brood. Nathan has wandered off somewhere to get drunk. You roam the family home that feels emptier now, lost in memories. You remember Gloria leading you by the hand through the yard and showing you the shining pillar for the first time. You remember playing together. You remember the time you and Stefan went looking for her in the Anazot ruins. You remember the quill and paper that were your sister's constant companions. The family remains in touch with the El Pelletiers and does its best to stay up to date on Gloria's married life. However, your sister rarely, if ever, leaves her husband's opulent estate. Her letters grow shorter and shorter. She writes about how her husband adores her and makes all her wishes come true, but she has fewer and fewer wishes every day. You beg Gloria to write poems for you, but she curtly responds that her inspiration is gone. Every day is too much like the last. The only thing that seems to bring her back to life is the odd visit from your family, but you must inevitably leave. 
and then Gloria goes back to spending days at a time in bed. Good lord. There is just no happy ending for Gloria, is there? Well, I mean, there is. She can become a Bronte. But that ruins it for the rest of us. So I can literally, again, only sever two ties with several ties with the family. Oh, one point off of unity, man. Jesus. Ah, uh, okay. That's going to need a playthrough dedicated just to that, I think. It's so hard to get. It's the highest my reputation's ever been. And that's where it ended up. God damn it. Fine. At least we can end this with Otten facing the honor court. Forsaken. We didn't have this before, even though we were in this exact situation. Ah, it's because my career was too low. That's why. Oh no. Please don't hurt my career. Days pass, then months. You've held up your end of the bargain with Magistrate El Vermin for quite some time. Sending him secret reports about the goings-on at the Prefecture and Elborn's plans. You've grown so accustomed to your weekly reports to the Chancellor that they seem like just another part of your work routine. You've grown used to your new position as well. With the influential Magistrate's patronage, many doors are now open to you. But soon after the breakup of your family, El Vermin sends you a letter. Dear Sir Nicolaus Bronte, I used to consider you a reliable ally. I made sure you were supported by the aristocracy. The rulers of the province had already agreed to make you a prefect in due time. You were one step away, but you ruined it all. Or did you think a nobleman could allow his family to collapse and escape with his honour intact? You have dishonoured my name as much as yours. I was a fool to trust a man who lost his own family and bloodline. You have ruined all my plans. I'll be straight with you. Our deal is off. Stay out of my sight and say nothing of our meetings, or you will regret it deeply. You helplessly crushed the letter in your fist. You have lost not only your family, but your magistrate's favour as well. You have no one to rely on now but yourself. Oh my god. Oh my god. Really? Really though? Son of a bitch. Oh my god, no. How am I in the exact same position again? It's unity. It's bloody unity. It's always bloody unity. 24 hours later and I'm still here. I haven't been doing this for 24 solid hours, that would be ridiculous, but I've taken a little break and I'm back. I've run through the game again and literally one decision, one decision was different right at the beginning of the game. So when Gregor brings a new lady home to try and set father up with a new wife, we have the option to leave with mother or stay and act cordial. I stayed with mother this time, I left with mother and that has bumped the unity up but not reputation down and I thought it would be okay but now we're in this position we can preserve the family which you know one one reputation away we were one reputation away I was kind of making notes and I think I know exactly what I need to do different to get us in the exact right position but honestly god help me I'm not doing it not right now I don't have the willpower literally what we're gonna do we're going to preserve the family and hope this doesn't trigger the vermin thing where he cuts me off because then I'm going to have to start all over again. It screws me with Grey War a bit, but honestly, I don't care. So we're not going to be a noble, but the family stays together. Please, for the love of God, do not screw me. Do not screw me. The empty chair. Is this the same? No. In response to your latest report, you receive a letter from Elbert. The envelope is made of intentionally coarse paper. According to noble custom, this is how good news is delivered. Sir Nicolaus Bronte, since our last meeting, you have achieved quite a lot in your post. I have not been idle either. I have provided you with the support of the nobles. The elite of the province are ready to make you the next prefect. There is just one step left. Elborn must relinquish the post of prefect. Fortunately, your reports have decisively proven that he is not worthy of our trust and must step down. Prepare to take his place when it becomes vacant, my friend. We have great deeds ahead of us. Yes, I am sure you know what to do with this letter. With a smirk, you burn the letter to ashes. Okay, no, don't bump my career up to three, you piece of shit. Um, okay, actually, that's probably fine because I still haven't done the trial. Or have I done the trial? I can't remember. I blitzed through this quite quickly. Um, okay, maybe we can get it down. If not, we're doing Night of the Serpents. Twilight over Anazots. Night is falling upon the city. You're about to leave the prefecture when El Vermin's assistant comes for you. 
the magistrate needs to see you urgently. You throw on a cape and attach your sword to your belt. On your way through the Silver Districts, you notice that many noble houses are flying flags, emerald serpents on a field of sable. This is the coat of arms of Archduke Melanidas. The lowborn servants look around apprehensively and double-check the bolts on the gate. The city hall is empty. There is no one in the building save for the guards at the entrance. You are escorted to Elverm's quarters. In the twilight, the magistrate's figure looms over the room like a long shadow. A servant lights the candles. The reflections of their flickering flame dance across the walls. It is time, Bronte. This night will be a difficult one for Anazot, but it will also go down in history, and we can take some credit for it, Sir Judge. This is the night we rid the province of its vilest enemies. You have done well. Your rulings in court, your defence of the nobles, your reports on Elborn's plans. They have allowed us to seize power. We will protect order and destroy those who are leading the province and the empire to rule. We have Archduke Melanidas himself on our side, as well as the noble elite of Anazot. This night, the noble militia will smite the supporters of Gaius Tempest. Elborn and the other false nobles who have forgotten honour and tradition in favour of lowborn rebels will soon meet true death at the hands of the Court of Honor. The Archduke will reclaim this province, and henceforth, no one will dare to defy the power of the nobility or attempt to strike the very foundations of the Empire. We have a long list of traitors. Sadly, your father Robert Bronte is among them. However, out of regard for you, I have excluded him from the list. Your family is safe. Elverman gives you a heavy parcel. This is the Archduke's flags. Fly it from the gate of your home, and your family will have no trouble. The militia will see that loyal supporters of the Archduke live within. You cannot hide your anxiety. How is it only now that you're hearing about this plan? How long has the Magistrate been preparing this? Oh come now, Bronte, don't get so worked up. Yes, I've concealed some of my plans from you, but it was for your own good. Do you have any idea how dangerous the preparations for this night were for me? I have spared you that. All my promises still stand. The position of Prefect will be yours. You will uphold the laws and protect order in the province. Now we just need a clear path for you. But the noble militia is saddling up already. Oh yes, and forget that so-called often case once and for all. The commander is on our side, and tonight he will lead the noble militia. Don't worry, I'll help you make peace with him. Take my advice, Bronte. Go home. Don't talk to anyone. Fly the serpent flag and go to sleep in peace. You have already done your part. If all goes according to plan tonight, Tomorrow you will awaken as the new prefect of Margra. You hastily leave the city hall and find yourself in the middle of a deserted square. Everywhere you look, shutters are drawn and doors are locked. A carriage rolls past you. You hear the sound of hooves in the distance. The city is anticipating trouble, but the ordinary citizens can't begin to imagine the massacre the magistrate and the archduke have planned. The sun has set. Darkness envelops Anazots. There is hardly any time left. If you're going to change sides, you must do it now. You can either accept the role the Magistrate has assigned you and retreat to the safety of your home, or rush to alert Elborn about the conspiracy in order to prevent the massacre. Okay... So I can warn Elborn, my career goes down to 7, and I die. Or I can go home, my justice goes down by 2, but my reputation goes up. Hmm. <laughs> if I do this... Then we get Night of the Serpents, which was originally my main idea, but then that's become my backup plan. Otten faces the Court of Honor. I need to get the career down to seven because obviously I've got the evidence, and that knocks it down. And if I do, if I go and warn Elborn, my career does go down to seven. Ooh, it's a risk, though, isn't it? It's a risk. Sod it. I'm doing it. I'm going to go warn Elborn. Night is near. You briskly walk up to the stairs of the prefecture, glancing over your shoulder with each step. Did you just see someone's shadow moving behind you? But here you are, in front of the prefect's doors. When you cross the threshold and tell Elborn about the noble conspiracy, you will have to confess your own betrayal. But you have to tell your superior about your weekly reports to Remiel Vermin, about the promise of the prefect's chair the magistrate made in exchange for your espionage. You summon your courage, open the door, and take a resolute step forward. When you think back on these events, you can't recall the beginning of this conversation. All you remember is the feeling of profound relief and the calm, attentive look in Elborn's eyes. A dismal silence fills the room. The Prefect has not uttered a single word all this time. Finally, he speaks. 
Oh, you are braver than I thought you were, Bronte. And I have long suspected that you've been dragged into some nasty business. But you have admitted the error yourself. Late though it be. I'll decide what to do with you later. The most important thing right now is to prevent the massacre. I'll inform the Overseer and the officers of the Legion at once. Hopefully the troops will have time to enter the city and stop the conspirators. As for you, Niklaus, go home and pray that the Legion remains loyal to the Overseer. You've done your part. When you go down the stairs to the carriage, two shadows detach themselves from the wall. Before you can draw your weapon, a knife sinks into your back. Again, again, and again. You fall down on the marble stairs, bleeding. You are dead. Shit. Okay. Well, there shouldn't be any more deaths now, hopefully. Cold pierces your newly reborn body. You get up and take a few steps on the smooth stone, getting accustomed to walking again. It's time to get back to your life. What happened in the world while your soul was on high? Father anxiously relates the events of the previous nights. The conspiracy that was about to destroy Elborn and the other supporters of Gaius Tempest fell apart. Apparently, Elverm and spies who stabbed you in the back reported to their master that the Overseer was gathering trusted troops and the element of surprise had been lost. The conspirators went to ground at once. The serpent flags vanished from the noble houses as quickly as they'd appeared. The battalions of the Imperial Legion that entered the city at dawn found its streets empty and peaceful. Remiel Vermin retreated to his country estate under the pretext of illness, although he has found out about the alliance between the Magistrate and the Archduke. Overseer Gaius Tempest has not yet decided to strike back at him. The guilt of the other conspirators, including Otten, is yet to be proven. A seasoned schemer, El Vermin has covered his tracks carefully. All you can do now is hope that your involvement in the conspiracy remains a secret from the Overseer. When you return to the Prefecture, you can hardly recognise it. Formerly swarming with people, complaints and disputes, it now resembles a sombre crypt. After finding out that the judges were behind the fall of the conspiracy, all the noble families of Anazot have turned against the Prefecture. Elborn has difficulty holding back the daily onslaught. He's forced to hide you from sight and forbids you from appearing in a courtroom. Your work is paralysed. Walking down half-empty corridors, you feel the cold stares of the other judges on your back. They look at you as though you were a man condemned to true death. Otten, Elverman, Gaius Tempest, Archduke Melanidas, you have managed to antagonise everyone with real power in the province. They all have a reason to dispose of you now. Will you be able to survive without powerful patrons? Probably not. Okay. <sighs> Let's see if I can actually do this now. So I can start a rumour with the aristocracy, which bumps my career up to eight, which is good. Oh my god. To ensure Rotten's downfall, you need to make arrangements. The Haughty Archeon still has too many friends in high places. You tell the driver to take you to the Gardens of Plenty, where most eminent Anazot nobles flock to enjoy an afternoon stroll. During this outing, you just so happen to meet many eminent nobles in the garden. After each exchange of pleasantries, you let them in on a little secret. Otten's days are numbered. Overseer Gaius Tempest is about to get rid of the unruly commander, and no one, not even Archduke Melanidas, can change his mind. Naturally, you realise the Ottons are one of the most ancient Harkonian dynasties, but who would dare to defy the will of the twins' blessed Tempest? Many of the noblemen you meet that day react to your words with incredulous looks, but you have the reputation of a respectable and powerful official privy to many secrets. Soon, the rumour of Ottons' imminent downfall begins to spread among the Anazot aristocracy. Many eminent noblemen are quick to disassociate themselves from the military commander in order to keep their own reputations safe. You rub your hands together in satisfaction. Soon. Very soon. Otten will be the only one unaware of his inevitable downfall. Okay, I'm hoping the fact that I have minus 10 willpower isn't going to be a problem. But let's go find out, shall we? Yes! Victory! Son of a bitch. This is... I did not think this run-through, of all the run-throughs, was going to be this much of a pain in the arse. You implore Elborn to leave the negotiations to you. This goes beyond the affairs of the Prefecture, you tell it. This is personal. When you're sure the Prefect is no longer watching, you summon a messenger and send him off with an urgent note to Iversea Gaius Tempest. You have spent all these years amassing influence, crafting connections, rendering favours, and reinforcing your career. Now the highest nobility and the mightiest Archneans in Anazot take heed of what you say and their patronage and their favour will finally bear fruit. You will finally get rid of Otten, your sworn enemy, and ensure that your career soars higher than ever. This makes, narrative-wise, or in terms of like the story and the way everyone feels at the moment, makes no sense that I'm still able to do this, but 
I'ma take it. The note to Gaius Tempest says you have overwhelming evidence of Otten's crimes, and your connections in high society are too strong for anyone important to contest it. Otten has murdered warriors of the Legion, defenders of the Overseer's power in the province. This makes him a traitor against Gaius Tempest, his lawful sovereign and representative of the Emperor's own dynasty. He must be punished for treason. You beseech the Overseer to come to the Prefecture at once with a garrison of troops, lest the traitorous Otten take the matter further. You seal the letter with your family crest. The messenger takes it and slips out through the hidden passage. All you can do now is wait and pray that Gaius Tempest is currently in the city. In the meantime, you instruct the other judges to sit still and await their rescue, then retreat to your office and lock the door. The air hangs heavy and oppressive over the city, a gloomy calm before the storm. Outside the window, you can hear the clanging of armour and Otten's menacing cries. Do not make me storm your offices by force, Bronte. I am speaking to you. Quit hiding from the inevitable. You've lost. Accept it humbly. Come outside and face defeat. The tone of his voice leaves no doubt. Otten is beyond furious. He's a moment away from committing full-scale slaughter in the Citadel of Law. With no other twists, you go down to the stairs and through the door to face Otten. He dismounts his horse but clad in a full suit of ancient armour, the Arcneon is still a head taller than you. Ah, here you are at last, Bronte. You obeyed me and came out. A wise choice. But where are all the papers you ought to burn? You stare down the High Commander and explain the situation to him. Otten's case is complete, and it will not burn. It'll be passed up the chain to the proper authorities. The people must know that Dorius Otten has willingly murdered 19 warriors of the Legion. This is an act of treason against Overseer Gaius Tempest and an insult to his honour. For this, Commander Otten will face His Highness's harsh retribution. How dare you speak of honour, pathetic human! Were you to meddle in Arcanian affairs? You hear a drum roll. Soldiers of the city garrison are marching towards the square. They're led by Gaius Tempest himself, riding a jet black steed. Dorius Otten, I, Gaius of the Tempest Dynasty, your overseer and commander, hereby assume command of this battalion. Soldiers of the Legion, return to your barracks. March. Your Highness, you have no authority over them. I am the High Commander. You speak of authority, Sir Otten. By my sacred right and authority, I challenge you to a jewel of honour. You have insulted me, your overseer, with your treason, and only blood can wash it away. Lies, your highness. Lies and slander you can never prove to the court of honour. Sir Nicholas Bronte says otherwise. I have no reason to doubt the words of such a distinguished judge. The rest of the aristocracy thinks the same. You solemnly nod, confirming the overseer's words, feeling all eyes focused on you. With a satisfied grin, Gaius Tempest continues. Otten, you will come to my headquarters at Castle Ennery, where your treason to the crown will be proven while the highest aristocracy of Margra bears witness. We will clash in a jewel of honour to the true death, as ancient tradition demands. May the justice of the heavens prevail in that fateful battle. <laughs> Doris Otten does not speak. His spirit crushed, his soldiers routed. Weakly, he gets back into the saddle and leaves the square. Alone and armour clad, like a painting of old, brought to life in the wrong age. Gaius Tempest dismounts his stallion and offers you his hand. You bow respectfully and shake hands with the Emperor's own brother. You were almost too late, Bronte. Your note found me while I was about to leave the city. Fortunately, I had loyal people by my side. I am glad to see you have proven yourself loyal to me. Otten's fate is sealed. With your influence and evidence you have amassed, not even the Archduke will be able to stand up for his protégé. I shall await you at Ennery as well, Bronte. You will proclaim the proof of Otten's treason and witness the jewel of honour first hand. You bow, recognising the great honour granted to you and your family. This is only the beginning, Judge Bronte. Prepare to take the Prefect's seat. You show far more promise than old Elborn. He does nothing but erode the ancient order, while you know how to maintain balance. People like you will save the Empire from revolt and ruin. Until we meet again at my castle. The Overseer and his warriors march back, kicking up clouds of dust. Elborn appears in the doorway of the Prefecture. He slowly walks out and casts a sorrowful eye over the now empty square. So you've squandered all those years spent on Otten's case just to curry favour with the Overseer Bronte. We could have brought one of the mighty Arcanians to justice. We could have shown everyone the power of the law, but you chose otherwise. And you chose poorly, I'm afraid. I chose the Empire. And also, you're fired. Can't you see what's happening on the streets? 
Can't you feel the pressure building up in the souls of the people from this tyranny? No friends in high places will save us when that tension finally reaches the breaking point, and neither you nor I will be able to do anything to prevent the fire and blood. Elborn shakes his head slowly and drags himself back to the office. You watch him leave, a lonely, bent old man. The sky over Amazon splits apart, showering the dust-covered streets with long-awaited rain. Okay. Well, it's not been an easy road to get here, but we're here. The lofty stone ceilings of Castle Ennery, the headquarters of Overseer Gaius Tempest, are enough to make anyone feel small and insignificant. The greatest aristocrats in the province have gathered here today, many of them Arcnians. But you, a human of common birth, have earned the right to share their company on this day as the accuser on behalf of Gaius Tempest. The servants announce the arrival of Commander Dorius Otten. The noble small talk stops, and Gaius Tempest takes his throne, his authority underscored by the majestic cloak draped around his shoulders. His face remains coldly indifferent. The doors open. Otten enters the hall and comes to rest in front of the overseer. He stands proud and defiant. Noble Arcnians and most worthy humans of Margaret, I have assembled you all so that you may witness an act of supreme justice. I hereby ask the Court of Honour to confirm my right to meet Dorius Otten in a sacred duel. Magistrate El Vermin, who represents the Court of Honour, approaches the Overseer's throne. Otten furiously tries to get the Magistrate's attention, but El Vermin doesn't even glance at him. Your Grace, the Court of Honour humbly begs you to state the reason for this duel. Sir Nicholas Bronte will speak in my name. I've just realised these two have the exact same voice. It's because my repertoire is very limited. Your time has come. You take a step forward, the weight of many gazes on your back. Step by step, you have fought hard to reassert the old traditions and defend noble honour. You have earned a noble reputation, a place among aristocracy. And with that, you have attained the power to punish Otten for his evil deeds. Your speech shakes the hall. Otten has taken the lives of at least 19 of his subordinates, strong warriors ready to fight for the Overseer. As part of a secret arrangement with the rebellious Archduke Melanidas, Otten has sought to eliminate officers loyal to the Overseer one by one. This is an act of treason against Overseer Gaius Tempest, and an insult to his grace's honour. You spit the last words right in Otten's face. The High Commander shudders with hatred. You, a former commoner, how dare you speak of an Arcanian's honour? Your words are as pathetic as your lowly birth. Silence, subject. Unlike you, Sir Bronte knows the meaning of honour and respect for authority. Does the Court of Honour doubt his words? The Court of Honour hereby accepts Sir Bronte's accusation. Through his actions, Otten has insulted his grace, Gaius Tempest. May the duel to the true death begin. May the ancestors of their bloodlines bear witness to the duel and guide their swords in sacred combat. May the younger carry out his justice through this battle. Gaius Tempest takes off his cloak. He walks down to the centre of the hall and draws his sword. Dorius Othan adopts a combat stance, then immediately attacks, making one jab after another. Justice is on my side, Gaius Tempest. You have seized the province for yourself. It belongs to the Archduke's bloodline by right. Now everyone here will watch you die for your dishonour. Gaius Tempest evades Othan's onslaught effortlessly, then launches an offensive of his own. You watch the two Arcanians fence, their battle and other worldly dance of death. You can almost see the two blood tides clashing spattering everything with drops of crimson as hundreds of ancestors guide each sword from behind the combatants. This is no mere fight. The Arcnian's forefathers are judging their progeny before your very eyes. Otten fights with frenzied ferocity, but with each swing of the sword, another ancestral shade withdraws into the darkness behind him. Eventually, Otten is alone. Alone against Gaius Tempest, who is backed by a retinue of brown-bearing shades. A strike, and then silence. Blood drips onto the dark marble of the great castle hall. Otten falls to his knees, wounded. With a loud clang, his sword drops from his fingers. Enough! I am no butcher. I will let him live. Before your eyes and in the sight of my ancestors, I have prevailed. The truth is on my side. Dorius Otten, you are hereby stripped of your sword and sentenced to eternal exile from the province of Margra. And anyone else who dares defy my rule shall face the same fate. The nobles kneel before the overseer. Otten heaves and pants, clutching at the fresh wound on his chest. Sir Bronte, act as my right hand and deprive Otten of his blade. Otten's sword comes to rest in your hands. The entire hall watches you, holding its breath. 
raising your old nemesis's weapon above your head, you turn and bow to the Overseer. You snap off his blade in half. The venerable old steel shatters with a ringing sound, reduced to pathetic, broken fragments. Blood trickles down your arms, and you don't notice the pain. Otten's eyes are dead and empty as he stares at you. He staggers to his feet, stumbles out the door, and walks away. His steps echo loudly in the deafening silence of the hall. And with that, the former commander of Margara is banished into exile. You have reached your goal, not through law and legislation, but through the power of noble tradition. The judgment of our ancestors is the highest justice there is. The Overseer graciously invites you to meet him one-on-one, -on -one, a sign of great favour. You have served me well, Bronte. The prefect's seat is yours. I shall appoint you the next time I come to Anazot. Be ready. The journey home is long and slow. You can't help but think of the unrest in Anazot. You have intervened in a conflict between mighty Archeans and changed the course of their fates. But what happened on the streets of your hometown while you were away? Death and destruction. Death and destruction. Oh jeez. Uh, achievement! I'm so glad I finally got that goddamn achievement. And that, my dear friends, is the end of peacetime. Let's breeze through revolt. At last, the day has come which would decide my fate, as well as that of my family, and perhaps the entire empire. The day of the revolt. Okay, so we need the Empire to come out on top here. The Court of Honor has meted out its justice. Victorious, you return from the Overseer's headquarters to Anazot, accompanied by a squadron of Legion soldiers. The soldiers have been assigned to you for the purpose of carrying out Gaius Tempest's personal orders. Bronte, I'm entrusting you with an affair of the utmost importance. During the last year, Anazot has veered dangerously close to a revolt. Commoners who refuse to know their place, conspirators, new faith fanatics, I have no choice. I must build an army to put an end to these disturbances. Sadly, Elborn appears to be too merciful and incapable of dealing with the unrest. Prove to me that you can take his place. Maintain order in the city until my arrival. You arrive in Anazot to find demonstrations in the squares, passionate sermons and demands for equality. The news that Otten has been tried by the Court of Honor merely fans the flames. The disgraced commander has returned to Anazot and refuses to go into exile. The city's on the brink of a revolt. Whatever the Court of Honor may have decided, my duty is to remain in Margra and stop this maddened mob. No, no, no. You, sir, appear to have misunderstood your sentence. After the humiliation Otten suffered in Enery, it's difficult for him to gather Anazot's noblemen beneath his banners. But many nobles who are against Gaius Tempest are outraged to see such an insult inflicted upon a fellow elite. They assemble a militia ready to deal with the disturbances. After receiving the news that Otten has refused to go into exile, the city seems about to burst into flames. The crowd in the square has become larger. Armed commoners take to the streets. Remiel Vermin is already dead. His life taken by the verdict of the people's court. He was strangled by the mob that broke into the city hall. The magistrate's lifeless body now hangs just outside the windows of his office for all to see. You have only one small squad of legionnaires under your command. For the moment, stopping the simmering revolt is simply beyond you. But tomorrow, everything could change. Okay. So I'm on the side of Empire, and I can't be having any of this common nonsense, so I need absolute annihilation of the revolt, ideally. I don't know which one I've had before. Let me consult my achievements and try and figure it out. So the only ending, well, there's two endings I haven't got ever, and that's the Surrender of the Revolt, which is the one obviously we're going to go for now, and Dark Times. So the Surrender of the Revolt is the peaceful ending, which is the hardest one. So <laughs> Revolt, zero. Troops, one, nobles two, clergy two, common folk two, power between minus three and minus four. We're going to go for it. If it doesn't pan out, it doesn't pan out. But that's what we're going to go for. So now the family's still together, I need to figure out what to do with them. Okay, sorry, we're going to go for this. The Brontes will oppose the revolt, because I've never done this before. And it's very fitting, because we are we are with the Overseer. <laughs> I'm certainly going to die in this anyway, because I don't know if I'm going to be able to save them, but we'll try. You and Stefan convince Father to openly side with the Overseer and work to quash the revolt. You slam your fist down on the table, unable to contain your indignation. Father is making a mistake. Even if the nobility and the Overseer are to blame for the rebellion, the Bronze family cannot stay out of this. The future of this city, your city, will be decided today. 
If the revolt takes root in Anazot, it will spread to the rest of the province, then plunge the entire empire into chaos. You have to fight against the revolt. You have to put an end to this. Stefan leaps to his feet. Your brother's been quiet all this time, but your words have emboldened him. Nikaos is right, father. I understand your compassion for the common folk, but uh, you and Elborn have already tried and failed to placate the people. Surely you see this. If the rebels seize power, the city will be domes. They'll drown all of Mara in blood. And when the common rebels seize power, do you think they'll remember everything you did for them? Do you think they'll let you and your family just walk away? No, they won't. We're noblemen. We're subjects of the Emperor, and it's our duty to suppress this rebellion while we still can. Stefan points at the sword in Father's hands. Remember your oath of honour, Father. You took up the swords, now use it to defend your family and your city. Father hesitates. You and Stefan stand above him, waiting. He looks at Grandfather's portrait on the wall. The late Gregor Bronte stares back at his progeny, implacable and stern. Father lets out a bitter sigh and grips his sword tightly. You're right, both of you. There's no way we can stay out of this. It pains me to no end that I must fight against my life's work, but this revolt will be the death of our city if I don't. The Brontes will fight by the Overseer's side. Stefan lets out a joyous cry. That's the spirit, father. I'll inform the noble families at once that the Brontes will fight for the lawful regime. Niklaus, you're not staying out of this either, are you? If we're to quash this rebellion, we need the city's gentry fighting by our side. Take care of yourselves, my sons. I'll see to the safety of our home. Stefan squeezes your shoulder, elated. Look at us now, Niklaus. Just a few years ago, you were a little boy and I was dragging you around by the ears. And here we are, about to fight off the rebels and rescue our city together. Who knew you'd grow up to be a real warrior? You grin at your brother and embrace him briefly with all your might, then leave the sitting room. It's time to get ready and muster all your strength. You're about to join the battle for the fate of the city. Then, at last, you step out the door and walk to the gate. This is where you belong now, on the streets where history is about to be written. Niklaus, uh, uh, hold on. You turn around and look behind you. The hunched, hapless silhouette of your younger brother appears on the steps. Nathan hurries towards you. I think... Oh, bu -bu. I think I'm going to have to be a dick to Nathan. Because I need the willpower. Okay, so at the moment, troops is good, nobles is good. Clergy is on one, so that needs to go up by one. Revolt is on... I don't know. Common folk is on to zero, so that needs a boost. And power is there, so not good. Clear enough? Good. Ba -bong. By their will. What are we going to do with Nathan? Walk away without saying anything. Sorry, Nathan, I need the willpower. Ba -da -ba. Still on minus five, which isn't great, but it's better than being on minus ten. Now, where are my forces going to come from? Where am I going to muster them from? Nowhere. <laughs> I'm going to bide my time. <laughs> okay, yeah, I couldn't have done anything anyway because you need to be ennobled by the swords to be able to do that. So, that's fine. Hopefully this will be okay. If this ends up with me just dying at the end because I've got no other choice, then so be it. Oh, I know this. This is X Octavia playing around in a fountain. So I can hand her over to the Inquisition with ups my clergy. Or part ways with her. Um, I need my clergy to be two, which this will put it on two. So goodbye, sweet ex Octavia. We did this before, so it's literally just that. We give her to the Inquisition, she burns to death. Another happy ending. Right, now let's see what we can do with Sir Elborn. I'm assuming I'm not going to be able to convince him to join with us, so I can await his decision, which ups the revolt, or I can condemn his decision which ups my common folk, which I need. I really need something to start knocking the revolt down. Though. It's the duty of the judge to follow the overseer's orders and suppress this revolt by any means. Done. Done and done. You start elbowing your way through the agitated crowd of judges and make your way up to the podium. You shove Elborn aside. Well done. Let Nicolas speak. You raise a hand and the judges grow silent. The overseer has ordered his subordinates to quash the riots. It's time for Sir Prefect to stop kowtowing to the mob. It's too late to resolve this situation peacefully. The fate of the Empire is at stake. The judges respond to your speech with joyous cries. Many of them draw their swords and raise them aloft, saluting you. Elborn winces. He'll find no support in this courtroom now. Very well, gentlemen. I cannot agree with this, but I am a servant of the Empire just like you, and just like you, I am honour bound to submit to his grace's will. 
We will follow the Overseer's orders and do our duty to the end, even if Anazov careens into oblivion in the process. No one hears the end of his speech. The judges are too busy giving orders to the gendarmes. Magnificent speech, Bronte. Finally, somebody had a backbone to put Elborn in his place. Now we'll bring order back to this city. You ask a nearby gendarme to find Captain Linad. They are to clear the rebellious mob out of the square for once. At once, not for once. That doesn't make any goddamn sense. But before the gendarme turns to leave, Captain Linad himself barges in the courtroom. He's panting. The sound of screams and clattering hooves fill the room. The riders are coming. It's so on and he's now in militia. I'm thinking I should have a brand new option this time with Otten. But we'll see. I might not have the willpower to do it. I hope I can do it though, because I think it'd be good. Hey! So challenge Otten to a duel. That doesn't really impact my stats either way. Maybe when I duel against him it will. Hopefully I can actually win the duel as he's, you know, wounded. He's got a puncture wound in his chest. That, that, that'd slow anyone down. To everyone's surprise, you walk confidently through the ranks of the gendarmes. The riders notice your raised arm and rein in their horses. The noblemen know who you are. And then you begin to speak, not to Watson, but to them. You're a loyal servant of the Emperor and the Overseer, just like Sir Elborn. Otten, however, has been stripped of his rank in disgrace by the Court of Honor. He no longer has any right to command the militia. The Overseer has spoken. Why are they defying him? <laughs> Flabbergasted at your audacity, Otten makes his horse prance, a menacing sight. Once a filthy commoner, always a filthy commoner, eh, Bronze? You orchestrated this dishonorable duel. It means nothing to true noblemen, and it never will. Refusing to dignify Otten with a response, you continue addressing the noble militia. If the good noblemen truly wish to side with the Overseer and his just rule, they must abandon their disgraced former commander and accept your command. This is treason, Bronte. Treason? Otten, of all men, dares accuse you of treason. You refuse to suffer such indignity. It's time to settle this once and for all. You challenge Otten to a sacred duel. If you emerge victorious, the noble militia will recognise you as their leader. Should Otten prevail, Elborn will surrender the prefecture without a fight. Otten sneers and casts a glance at the prefect. Elborn's eyes meet yours. He hesitates. He spent years struggling against the ancient right of the duel. So be it. Let the trial of honour begin. Otten gets down from his horse and postures haughtily. At last, Bronte. I can't believe how long it's taken me to finish you off. The stunned mob parts, giving you ample space for a duel. You draw your sword and step towards your nemesis. The time has come for your final battle. Well, I really hope I don't die. The prefect's voice booms over the square, raspy with tension. The greatest enemy of the right of single combat has no choice but to announce the duel. Dorius of the Autumn Dynasty and Nicolaus of the Bronte bloodline will now cross swords in mortal combat. I summon their ancestors to bear witness to their duel. May their blood tides meet in a sacred bond and determine the truth. May the younger witness our trial and behold the power of his inevitable law. The mob that surrounds you falls silent. The whispering wind is the only sound you hear. There's no more time for solemn ceremonial bows. You and your foe are about to clash in a merciless battle. You've got quite the nerve, Bronte, crossing the lines like that. I know that full well. But how will you fare in a real fight? Before finishing his sentence, the Archean lunges at you with a rising slash swift as a venomous snake. You vividly recall Otten's trial by combat at Castle Innery. He tried the same trick on Gaius Tempest. You lean to the left quickly, dodging the mortal blow. Otten bares his teeth and strikes again, faster than lightning. You manage to parry his lunge. Sharpened steel screeches against steel, yet the Archean's inhuman strength ultimately overwhelms you. He pushes until the edge of his blade bites into your shoulder. Cold steel slices through your jacket and sinks into your flesh but you manage to fight through the pain. With a burst of strength, you shove Otten's blade away. The two of you stand face to face, panting loudly. Warm blood drips down onto your clothes. There are whispers in the mob. Bronte's done for. Why did he even challenge an Archean? <laughs> Otten allows himself an arrogant chuckle. Your blood is weak, Bronte. But well, what do you expect? Once a commoner, always a commoner. Your grandfather was born a peasant, and your father never became a true nobleman. <laughs> Slowly, Otten creeps towards you preparing to strike again. The Archean's cold eyes glints with adamant confidence in his own superiority. His sword flashes in the light of the sun, heralding your impending demise. You assume a fighting stance again, mustering the last of your strength. The next moment will decide the outcome of this duel. I'm going to defeat Otten, which knocks power down to minus three, which is good. The revolt down to three, which is good. 
troops up to three, which is good. That only needs to be at one. Uh, nobleman's, nobles is already maxed out. Common folk up to two, which is great. All good. And puts me on zero willpower. And also, uh, achievement. You grip the hilt of your sword and exhale calmly. The Arcanian wants to throw you off balance. He wants to see fear in your eyes. This will never happen. You've fought many battles over the years. Combat has tempered you, made you stronger. Otto was born an Arcanian. That one advantage doesn't mean that you will yield. So you hold still and wait, watching the Arcanian's every move. Otto leans forward slightly. You quickly step back, the tip of your blade dancing in circles before you. Trying to run from me, eh, Bronte? I'm afraid it's too late for that. Another feint distracts your nemesis, and you push this advantage. A quick step forward, a lunge, a hit. The tip reaches Otten's face. A longer blade would have pierced his head, but yours leaves a mark. Otten jumps back. Dark blue blood slowly begins to ooze out of the fresh cut on his cheek. Stunned, the Archeon wipes it off with the palm of his hand. Ugh, pathetic human runt. That's it. I'm done playing with you. His patience exhausted, the Archeon leaps forward determines to finish this. You wait for the final blow to land, but it never does. Instead, to your surprise, he throws his cloak in your face. For a moment, you lose track of your foe. Out of options, you close your eyes and lunge forward with all your might, leaving yourself wide open. Your sword seems to guide your hand as you move. The blade runs through the crimson silk of the cloak with no resistance, and pierces the flesh of your nemesis behind it. You open your eyes. Otten is swaying from side to side, clutching the blade of your sword with both hands. He has been run through. No, curse you. Curse all humans. You forgot your place. Otten's sword drops to the cobblestones with a loud clang. The Arcanian warrior sways slightly to the side one more time, then falls flat on his back. The trial of honour is at an end. Dorius Otten will not return from the hereafter. The duel is over. Nicolaus with the Bronte bloodline is victorious. Proven righteous in the younger sight by sacred combat. The nobles are utterly speechless. For the first time ever, an Arcanian has fallen to a human in combat. You are dead tired. Still, you have enough strength to speak to the noble militia. It's time for them to keep their word. They will swear loyalty to the overseer and accept you as their interim commander. One by one, the noble riders bend the knee and take an oath of fealty to you. From this moment forth, until overseer Gaius Tempest returns to Anazot to reinstate his lawful rule, you will command his army. You motion for the prefects to address the mob. Elborn turns to you. There are tears in his eyes. I'd rather abandon my vision than condemn my city to the flames of rebellion. And if the people I've spent my life protecting consider it treachery, then so be it. This is the price I must pay. People of Anazot, I, Prefect Elborn, remain ever loyal to the Emperor and his overseer, His Grace Gaius Tempest. The Prefecture shall continue to maintain law and order in the city along with the noble militia. You must cease and dissent at once. Return to your homes and await the Overseer's mercy, and I promise you all a better life and justice in the future. Those who remain outside and loot other people's property will face dual punishment at the hands of the Gendarmes. The mob obeys. The people disperse without the need for force. With the Prefecture's Gendarmes fighting side by side with the noble militia, they do not stand a chance. Still, it's far too early to celebrate. The leaders of the revolt may still try to unite their forces. Elborn casts a mournful, defeated gaze over the square, empty in the wake of the duel. Your skill is astonishing, Bronte. That makes it all the sadder that you had to resort to manslaughter to prevail in this struggle. I've worked so hard to suppress this criminal custom, but all the blame falls squarely on me, and I'm ready to accept it. There's no other way. Look at the price we've paid to save the city from ruin, Bronte. Now I can only hope that sacrificing our principles will be worth it in the end. But I suppose now is not the time for regret. You should head to the Silver Tree. Lenard's procession must be en route to the Silver Tree by now. The enemies of the New Faith are waiting there, weapons in hand. They'll massacre each other unless we stop them. The city is a powder keg with a short fuse. More fire and blood is the last thing we need. But if Lenard is pronounced the new Patriarch, the revolt will gain a powerful leader. We won't stand a chance if that happens. You'll have to make a choice there, Bronte. It won't be easier. Easy. You nod to Elborn. The fate of the feud between the two faiths will be decided in the Clash of the Silver Tree. You have to be there. You wish the Prefect luck, then muster your loyal forces and head for the tree. Okay. Not happy about having zero willpower. That is a no bueno. Right, 
Right, now let's see A, what we can do about this, and B, what we want to do about this. So I can fend them off with the Champions of Faith. So that knocks the Revolt down to two, which is good. Uh, troops and Clergy are both maxed out. Good. Common Folk knocks down to one, which is potentially a bit of a problem. I don't know if we have done this, but I'll read through it like we haven't, because I, if we have, it was a while ago. There can never be peace between the Inquisition and the New Believers. Sister Jen is right. The dispute between them has been going on for years. Neither side will ever yield to the other. Right now, there's only one thing you can do. Rescue as many of them as you can from what's to come. Go, in the name of the Younger. The Champions of Faith obey Jen's orders. They get into formation and begin advancing on the New Believers, weapons in hand. The unarmed mob recoils in fear. But those in the front row are pushed from behind and driven onto the blades. Blood splatters onto the stairs of the sacred temple. A woman's screams of rage rends the momentary silence. Madness! <laughs> Chaos breaks loose. The champions of faith try to advance on the people, but the enraged horde will not be driven back. They rush at the warriors, trying to break their ranks by sheer force, dragging or knocking them to the ground one by one. No, stop, don't do this, do not resort to bloodshed. The abbot does his best to rein in his flock, but they won't listen. You shout to your followers, now. Your people join the fight, side by side with the champions of faith who try to hold back the commoners. It's an arduous task. They're unarmed, but they greatly outnumber you. Hold the line. Behind you, the inquisitors raise thin silver slabs and shout incantations. Flurries of silver sparks spread across the front lines of the jostling mob, binding them with the power of the twins. They collapse, but others immediately take their place. Hold the line. Every minute of this fight feels like an eternity. Eventually, the furious onslaught seems to subside. You catch a glimpse of Jen. She throws away a fading slab of silver and clutches her sword, then breaks the line and dashes forward with a fearsome cry. She's headed straight for Lenart. The abbot struggles to remain on his feet in the frenzied human storm raging around him. It takes him a moment to notice Yen, her ceremonial blade raised aloft. Lenart meets her with a confused look. His arms move slowly, trying to shield his face. But it's too late. The Inquisitor strikes. At the last possible moment, the rage on Yen's face gives way to terror. She leans into her swing with all her might and guides the blade aside. It slips out of her hand. The battle still rages around you, but you clearly hear the steel clatter against the marble slabs of the stairs. My child! A moment later, a heavy stone flies through the air and hits Jen square in the side of the head. She yelps and falls down. Hurry, you need to reach her before she's trampled. A mighty gust of wind rushes over the square. It roars, howls, almost screams, filled with remorse, agony and wrath. An unearthly chill runs down your spine. This is it. This is what Sister Jen told you about. The earth begins to tremble beneath your feet, before your very eyes, as though in some terrible nightmare. The roof of the sacred temple begins to shake, and the pillars start to sway back and forth. Oh, gods! You turn to your followers and scream at the top of your lungs, gesturing wildly to the Inquisitors. Fall back, hurry, follow me. The commoners try to flee the square, darting down back alleys, trampling one another. For you, there's nowhere to run. Only the trunk of the silver tree offers some protection, so you rush to the white trunk as fast as you can. The world is turned upside down, like a kaleidoscope shaken by a massive hand. For several seconds, everything blends together. You fall flat on your back. Where the temple at the silver tree once stood, there's nothing. The grand, majestic structure is no more. It's been levelled to the ground. Remnants of its walls and roof are scattered across the square. The stairs that once led to it have been ground into gravel, but the massive trunk shielded you from the falling rubble. A cloud of dust slowly settles upon the square. After the dust come the leaves. Thousands and thousands of leaves shed by the silver tree. They cover the corpses of the truly dead like a pale white shroud. The entire square glows as the bodies of those yet to be reborn dissolve into nothingness. There are so many that the light stings your eyes, even through the thick dust that still hangs over it all. Just how many people met their deaths today? You stagger to your feet and go to where you last saw Jen. You find the Inquisitor in a small space between two shattered slabs of stone, curled up into a ball. 
Her body shakes as she sobs uncontrollably. All is lost. All of it. Everything. Couldn't do it. I couldn't see it through to the end. Do you understand? I betrayed them. I couldn't kill the heretics. The temple is gone because of me. The Inquisition is gone because of me. You gently tap her on the shoulder. That isn't so, you tell her. The Inquisitors and the Champions are all safe, and Lennart is dead, buried in the ruins of his own temple. But Jem was spared by the wrath of the gods. What is she saying? How could she possibly think she betrayed them? Jen grows silence. She slowly rises to her feet, breathing heavily. <sighs> Don't understand all of this. Just leave me be. The young woman walks away from you unsteadily. A few steps away, she stops, her arms crossed. She stares at the ruins. The captain of the Champions of Faith approaches you. I'm afraid Sister Jen won't be able to command us from now on. My champions owe you their lives. What are your orders? You have to take the lead. So you begin mustering your forces and getting ready to move to Empire Square. Enormous crowds of people are already on their way there, about to choose the leader of the Anazot Rebellion. The sun slowly begins to set. Hmm. Ba 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 ba. Ba 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 indeed. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about this. I think I'm just going to have to let this one play out. Ooh, big oof. Big oof on that one. So yeah, don't get involved. I, Sophia takes center stage and does whatever she does. They get plus two revolt, which is nasty. If I was able to do break up the mob, that would be that would be a good thing to have. Okay, I'm gonna jump back quickly and just see if I can. I'm just gonna check something. I'll either see you there or I'll see you back here. Let me. I just need to just stop. Stop judging me. So I'm thinking instead of the Brontes will oppose the revolt. I'm going to do agree with father and protect the home because either way, they're at home. It's okay. So we're going to go for that. It ups, that ups my nobles, but I don't need my nobility to be upped. So, okay. First change, we're going to do this because that gets me plus five willpower. I'm still going to walk away without giving Nathan an answer because willpower. Mustering my forces, doing, biding my time got me 10 willpower. So I'm now on 10 willpower, which is good. A lot better than last time. Okay. We're back. So <laughs> break up the mob. That drops that down to zero, which is great because it means my family won't die. Troops goes down to two, which is okay. Nobles and clergy are already maxed out. Power goes down to minus two, which is potentially a problem. That's maybe too low. No, nope, that'll go down to minus four. So that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That just means my common folk is the only one I'm worried about. That needs to be up to two. I might be able to do something about that in the next selection, but I don't know. If Sophia manages to unite the mob around her leadership, the revolt will consume the entire city. You can't let that happen. If there's ever a time to strike, it is now. Sophia's not shown up yet. You seize the moment and command all your forces to begin an all-out attack on the square. Your troops smash into the human sea in front of the chancellery, hurling people aside and hacking through the throng as they advance. As you command them, you shout at the mob at the top of your lungs. Leave the streets, go home and you'll be spared. Whoever stays here will face our blades. The rebellious rabble did not see the attack coming. Your forces are resilient and the crowd panics. The rebels have no choice but to flee. Dozens of people fall to the ground in the mindless jostling throng, only to be trampled by the fleeing horde. Blood runs down the cobblestones. The corpses of those killed dissipate in shimmering mist. Before long, your men control the blood splattered square. They celebrate their victory with joyous cries. But a voice simmering with rage soon cuts through the air from the direction of the chancellery stairs. The last straw. Ready. Aim. Fire. Rebel squads dash out of the chancellery, firearms in hand. The volleys come in quick succession. A hail of bullets hits the square, sparing no one from either side. Commoners trying to escape die along with your soldiers. You are losing men. The last straw's position is too strong here. You can't advance on the Chancellery in the face of their gunfire. Out of options, you are a retreat. You breathe a sigh of release once the last of your men have left the square. The deed is done. You lost too many men, and Sophia is still running amok, but you still manage to deal a resounding blow against the revolt and shatter the rebels' morale. The news that you disperse the mob at Empire Square spreads throughout the city like wildfire. The nobility and old faith clergy celebrate the victory, more eager than ever to keep fighting by your side. A report soon arrives from the scouts at the gates. The Legion is only a few hours away. The final battle is drawing near. 
Will the outcome of the revolt be decided in combat, or is there a peaceful solution? It all depends on the actions you take in the coming hours. Okay. Concerned about my willpower, because there's no way I'm getting that hot out. Final hour. <sighs> what are we going to do? Oh, yes. Yes. Go see your born. That is the last piece of the puzzle slotted nicely in place, which means we can get a peaceful ending. Which seems weird having this as the peaceful ending, but it's the one we needed. While the city squares are consumed by unrest, the defenders of the Empire will be too busy breaking up street brawls to assist the Legion when it arrives. You need to do all you can to break up the gangs of rebelling commoners. While there's still time, you take a few trusted men and head to the prefecture. Elborn greets you on the stairs, surrounded by gendarmes. You waste no time and promptly ask the prefect to place the gendarmes under your command. Elborn nods somberly and turns to the defenders of law and order. Gendarmes, when you began your service at the prefecture, it was not to take up arms against the simple folk. You came here to maintain order and defend our citizens against lawlessness, whatever their estate. But a dark day is upon us. It is our duty to save Anazoth from chaos and destruction. We have been unable to convince the insurgents with words, so now your clubs will have to do the talking for you. Purge the streets of rebellion. Pave the way for the overseer's army. Nicolaus Bronte will lead you. An intimidating cordon of gendarmes marches down the main streets of the city, beating their clubs against their shields in a measured rhythm. You lead the squadron, dispersing the rebellious crowd and dismantling barricades as you go. The gendarmes swing their clubs right and left, quickly routing those who resist them. Over the course of an hour, you manage to quash disturbances in a significant portion of Anazot's main squares, but the insurgents' main forces have established a foothold by the city gate. The gendarmes' numbers are not sufficient enough to attack them. Midnight strikes. You can hear the menacing tread of the legion outside the city walls. The time has come. You order your troops to assemble and prepare to head for the gate. Please let me get the ending I need. Perfect. <laughs> I can flee the city. Ah, that gets me dark times. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, I'm not going to do that, but that's good to know. So yeah, force the rebels to surrender the city. Perfect. The entire city's behind you. You can avoid bloodshed and force the insurgents to lay down their arms without fight. Oof. Oh, sorry, I think I have a bit of glitter in my beard. I don't know how long that's been there for, but that's embarrassing. The watchmen bring you alarming news. Instead of responding, the rebels shot the herald sent by Gaius Tempest. The legion is about to attack. The rebels' defences are too secure. Not even the legion could take the city in a single assault. The offensive will be repelled without fail. Anazot is in for a lengthy siege. The revolt will continue to fester within its walls until the city rots from the inside. Disturbances will break out all over the province and spread to the rest of the empire. You cannot let that happen. It's now or never. You will use your influence to stop the revolt without further bloodshed. You take the lead of a gigantic procession composed of your supporters. Guarded by loyal troops, you march through the empty streets to the insurgent camp. Nobles, clergymen, commoners, all of the estates of the city follow you to demand an end to the revolt. Your procession reaches the square by the city gate. The rebel camp is encircled by a row of barricades. Behind them are rows of muskets and spears, all aimed at you. But no one dares to attack you. From the top of the wall, you hear the leader of the insurgents, her voice hoarse. Damn it! Everybody, defend the camp! Fire! But instead of gunshots, you hear only grumbling from the barricades. Are you dead? Shoot them! Or do you want them to take away your rights and make you all slaves again? Without fear, you step towards the barricade. The square behind you is packed with people of all estates. You announce that the entire city of Anazot is against the rebellion. It will return to lawful imperial rule this very day. You tell the insurgents that they must lay down their weapons, surrender, and beg the overseer for mercy. They are outnumbered. The city is on your side. Behind you, the crowd bellows loudly, Down with the revolt! Surrender! No more blood! You shout to Sophia's confused soldiers that further destruction will not save them. Sophia is a mad woman. She's used her people to fan the flames of the revolt, but she cares nothing for them. All the people of Margaret will get from this insurrection is more suffering. 
Is that what they want? Renounce your loyalty to Sophia, turn her over, and lay down your arms. Never. You knew this moment would come, men. We'll fight to the end. Freedom or death. The massive mob freezes involuntarily. The leader of the revolt comes down from the wall. Her eyes aglow with a furious yellow light. People, this imperial lapdog is lying to you. If you believe Bronte, you'll be slaves forever. He's trying to scare you with fire and destruction. But isn't that what you signed up for? We're going to destroy the old order. We're going to level it to the ground. The most loyal of Sophia's supporters raise their guns, but the others can't withstand the pressure. Flatly refusing to follow Sophia's orders, they drop their weapons one after another. If you ain't with us, you're against us. Die, traitors. A fight breaks out within the insurgent camp as Sophia and her loyal soldiers attack the defectors. Gunshots, cries, smoke, yellow sparks. Eventually, it comes to an end. The remaining insurgents emerge from behind the barricades, their hands in the air. Sophia is thrown at your feet. Her arms bound, the rebel glares at you from behind a mass of tangled hair, her face contorted in hatred. Don't get your hopes up, Bronte. The fire I started will rage again soon enough. You and this whole monstrous world are going to burn. Bitter tears run down Sophia's cheeks. For a split second, you see the frightened girl from next door, pursued by terrifying horsemen. You look away. The Imperial authorities and Overseer Gaius Tempest will decide this criminal's fate now. The resistance has been crushed. Even the most ardent last straw fighters surrender their weapons grimly. The rest of the insurgents flee the walls, trying to escape down back alleys. They are not followed. Enough blood has been spilled today. The people gathered in the square shout loudly, Victory! Nicolas Bronte! Blow away! Blow away! With a triumphant air, you give the order to open the gates. It swings open, creaking heavily. You stand before the gathering in the square and await the arrival of the Overseer. Tonight, you have saved your city, extinguishing the flames of a rebellion that threatens to spread across the entire empire. You look back at the years gone by, all the difficult decisions you had to make, all the actions that helped you take your place in the history of the empire. Your destiny has been fulfilled. Whew. Oh, achievement. Okay, so literally the only ending I have left to get now is fleeing. The That's revolt it. revolt was crushed. And it was I who restored order in Enizote. Mine was a victory for all of the Empire. What should we say to the old man today? Ah, uh, we've done all these. I kind of wish I'd have done this when I had the Amazon Massacre, but we'll have to come back and do that another time. Um, we'll take back care of the world. We'll do that. We've done that before. Just means the twins get closer to us and love us even more. Okay, right. Now, what has happened to the world? With your assistance, the Imperial Loyalists crushed the rebellion in a single night without further bloodshed. After swiftly quelling the unrest in Anazox, Overseer Gaius Tempus restored order within the city's walls with an iron fist. All the leaders of the revolt met their final deaths at the end of a noose. But any rebels who surrendered before they used their weapons against the Legion were granted mercy. The Arcnian ruler was as good as his word. After his swift victory, Gaius Tempest's authority grew stronger. Now that his subjects had been pacified, the eminent gentry and the Archduke sympathizers no longer had a chance to stop him from ruling Margaret as he saw fit. Once the rebellion had been silenced, the province finally entered an age of peace. And yet, the Overseer learned much from the lessons of the Amazon Revolt. He realised that he had no choice but to address the woes of the lowly estate, lest further turmoil sweep across the land. Gaius Tempus took advantage of his growing power and finally began his first careful reforms. The nobles' privileges remained unchanged, but little by little, the common estate came to enjoy new protections under his rule. In time, the rest of the empire came to the same conclusion. The order established by the twins must remain unchanged, but if the realm wished to enjoy prosperity and peace, then everyone, or everyone, from lowly commoner to highborn Arcnian, must be protected equally by the strong arm of the law. For the first time in centuries, there was change, albeit gradual change guided by eminent nobles and the royal Tempest dynasty in their stern wisdom. Not a bad outcome for the people. Power. The power struggle in the province was fierce, but in the end, Gaius Tempest remained the overseer of Margaret. His authority suffered from the feud with Archduke Melanidas and the years of unrest that preceded the revolt, and yet the Arcnian Lord had the wisdom to surround himself with loyal allies and garner support with the Maegra nobles. 
No one could challenge the Overseer's rule now. Margaret is part of the Empire, and the Tempest Dynasty has been chosen by the Twins themselves to rule over it. Such is their grand design, and so it shall be for all eternity. Church, okay, yep, so Church, they're still arguing amongst themselves, we know this. Wealth of Margaret. The farmers, miners, and tradesmen of Margaret managed to survive the years of unrest. Once those dark days were behind them, they quickly recovered. The fields filled with imported soil continued to supply the people with food, and the Magra and Silver Mines maintained a steady flow of the blessed metal to the rest of the Empire. Whatever happens next, the province is safe from poverty and hunger. Order. So, we're in peacetime now, so that's good. Divine Omens, we know this. Augustine Elborn. Augustine Elborn did his duty as the highest judge in the province and maintained law and order in Amazon. He did all he could to curb the rebellion and put a stop to the chaos and bloodshed. The aged judge was rewarded for his service by Overseer Gaius Tempest, becoming a member of the Overseer's inner circle and his personal advisor. Together with his patron, Elborn worked to strengthen the rule of law and gradually granted the common estate more rights. Through Elborn's contribution, the barbaric traditions of the nobility were finally laid to rest. Sir Elborn died of old age, surrounded by friends and family. He is remembered as a prominent public official of the New Age. That's a pretty good ending for him. He got everything he wanted. The Brontes. You defended the family home from the frenzied mob. I didn't. That never happened. The Bronte family remained aloof from the struggle on that fateful day. Thanks to your efforts, they survived the dreadful night that followed. Once the Imperial forces were victorious, your family returned to life as normal. At first, the aristocracy accused them of cowardice, since no Bronte helped the Legion's cause. But the family never sided with the revolt either. Their honour remained untarnished, and your heroic acts at the city gate kept them safe. Your family survived every ordeal and finally found peace. Robert. Once the unrest in Anazot was quelled, Robert Bronte resumed his duties at the prefecture. But after the terrible events of the revolt, his views changed and he abandoned his long-cherished goal of attaining more freedom for the common folk. Your father became a resolute supporter of the Overseer's uncompromising rule and served to protect law and order in the province until he breathed his last. Stefan. Stefan agreed with your father's decision not to take sides. When the Empire turned the tide in the battle for Anazots and you were out there making history, he remained idle. He regretted this choice bitterly for the rest of his life. His efforts to secure a flourishing career never brought him any success. Stefan had no choice but to abandon his aspirations and make do with what he already had. Your elder brother cast aside his old unrequited love for Maria El Velasco. In time, he managed to secure a successful marriage to another noblewoman of the sword, albeit one of less eminent birth. After the wedding, Stefan and his wife moved to her family's estate, but he never lost touch with the Brontes and dedicated himself to improving the family's reputation and continuing its legacy. Stefan El Bronte was remembered by those around him as an honest and honourable nobleman. Gloria Gloria's new life as a nobleman's wife put an end to her youthful ardour. When she moved to her husband's home, her fervent poetry and her struggle in the name of the common folk remained in the past. She languished in her newfound monotony at first, mourning her fate. But her connection to the Bronte family remained. Through this surviving link, Gloria found the strength to overcome her alienation and pull herself out of the depths of melancholy in which she was mired. Slowly but surely, she came to recognise and accept the genuine love of Sir Jose El Pelletier, and in time she responded to his selfless and cordial care with deep gratitude. Gloria eventually came to terms with her newfound life in the noble estate, far from the city. She soon gave birth to the first of their children and dedicated herself to raising the heir of the great El Pelletier bloodline. And so, Gloria spent the rest of her life far from the turmoil of Anazot, surrounded by comfort and warmth until the end of her days. My god, a good ending for Gloria. Ish. What became of me? At the fateful hour, you were the one who led the soldiers of the Empire to victory. Gaius Tempest makes you his right-hand man at court. The Emperor himself expresses his gratitude to you. Nicolaus of the Brontes is the pride of the Empire and the bulwark of her prosperity. His service for the good of the realm shall be remembered for all time. You are rewarded by Overseer Gaius Tempest with the title of Prefect. You replace Elborn as the head judge of Margaret, tasked with dispensing the highest justice. For the rest of your days, you continue to maintain law and order in your home city and province. Despite your humble origins, you have soared to the top. You are remembered as the saviour of Anazot in the face of a great rebellion a judge of immense authority, and a man with a most peculiar destiny. So ends the life and suffering of Sir Nicolaus Bronte. Whew. Shame I'm about to go to the foot of the pillar. Right. I'm going to the foot of the pillar, and I've got an achievement. 
The sword strikes. The blade mercilessly slices the minuscule soul in twain. It shatters into a multitude of sparks. Each of these sparks was once a dream, a deed, a thought, a hope. The sparks fly down. Down to the foot of the shining pillar to the eternal darkness of non-being. The lonely light is slowly extinguished. The man named Nicolaus Bronte is no more. He has finally come to know true suffering. He has become nothing. Oh, okay. I was kind of expecting it to be a little bit more dramatic than that, but all right. This has been the hardest one to get so far. I can't believe that literally it came down to having to change something in childhood. I had to go that far back just to change it. And I didn't even get the good ending. I didn't even ennoble myself. I was one reputation away. But at least being one reputation off, but having the unity meant I could actually keep everyone together. As opposed to before when I was fine with reputation, but bad with unity. Because then the family fell apart. Elverman cast me aside and I got stabbed to death. So I'll take what I can get. But we still need to get ennobled. We still need to flee the city. There's still a few more things I want to do. So... If you want to check this out for yourself, then the link to the game page is in the description. If there's anything you want to see or you want me to make sure I cover in my mop-ups, then let me know. Leave me a comment. Thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, then why don't you go ahead and smash the like button. The uphill battle that is the subscribe button, make sure you that bad boy. And until next time, love you, bye.